This is section zero, introduction, of the complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Greenman. The complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. Introduction by Walter Raleigh. It would have given no displeasure to Sir George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax, to think that by later generations of his countrymen he should be almost forgotten. Statesmen are easily forgotten. A prosperous lie made Titus Oates immortal. But the man who was the practical genius of the English Revolution, and the acutest critical genius among English politicians, is now little more than a name. What is most commonly remembered about him is that he was called the Trimmer. The nickname was put upon him angrily by his contemporaries, and was worn proudly by himself. The imputation it conveyed was, no doubt, that he trimmed his sails to the varying breezes of opinion. But in his famous pamphlet, the noise of which still echoes distantly in the public ear, he changed the metaphor. A boat, he said, goes ill, and is in danger of capsizing, if the people in it weigh it down all on one side, or all on the other. But there is a kind of men, who conceive that it would do as well if the boat went even, without endangering the passengers. And it is hard to imagine, he adds, how it should come to be a fault, or a heresy, to attempt to trim the boat. He calls it a boat. He never uses magnificent or extravagant language. But what he means is the ship of state, that ship on whose seaworthiness the lives even of the mutineers depend. Halifax was a pilot for the greater part of his responsible life, and his chief care was always the state. His reputation has none of that glamour which shines upon heroic folly. The leader of a forlorn hope excites a ready enthusiasm, the martyr for an idea, the rebel who will have his own way or nothing, the stickler for principle, who cares little to stay in a world where his darling creed is not to prevail. All these are easily made into heroes and worshipped for their courage. But the pilot, to whom danger and difficulty are not heroic crises, but the very material of his craft, or the engine-driver, who has had the care of a thousand lives in his sole charge, goes home unnoticed, and takes his modest wage. On his constancy and judgment the safety of humanity depends. His faith and skill have made it possible for the thoughtless passengers to dream in peace, and to warm their imagination with the admirable deeds of fiction. Life would be a poorer thing than it is, if work of this kind were rewarded by monuments and testimonials and public fame. The old Roman way is better. Expect the best from your political servants, and try them for treason if they give you less. Not many men have written books on the practical business of their lives. Statesmen have commonly been content to make laws or treaties, leaving it to philosophers to expound the principles of politics. It is the fascination of the writings of Halifax that they were suggested by his experience of life, and are crammed with the lessons drawn directly from that experience. Here are no flights of the imagination no ingenious ornaments of style, no beautiful vanities of authorship. He quotes none of those fallacious historical precedents which are dear to the mind of the academic scholar. His writings are bare of classical illusion. What he has to tell is what he has found out for himself in the course of his traffic with the world. But he tells it with so much wit and irony with such acuteness of observation and pungency of phrasing, that he runs some risk of losing the esteem of those who think that wise men must needs be dull. Moreover, books have failed from time immemorial to convey the lessons of experience, 
and the wisdom of life can be bought only by the expenditure of life itself old men would be very glad to tell what they know but they cannot hope to be understood if they are wise they say little if they are foolish they babble pleasantly enough but have nothing to tell halifax has much to tell but a beginner is not likely to learn it on the other hand a man who has served on a jury or has stood in election or has been responsible for the management of any business will feel a thrill of pleasure when his own experience is brought home to him again in that brilliant epigrammatic dress english literature is very rich only a very rich literature could have afforded to neglect so distinguished a writer but it is not rich in practical wisdom and the neglect of halifax is a thing to be regretted and amended his writings are strangely modern and withal are wholly english the politics of this country have altered very little one would say since the days of the exclusion bill indeed it is one of the chief attractions of seventeenth-century history that there is hardly a live question to-day which was unknown to the men of that time it is something to feel that we are not more fantastic or absurd than our ancestors any one who reads the pamphlets which contain halifax's reflections on the controversies of his own time will find himself almost against his will applying these reflections to the matter of to-day no violence is required to make the application page after page of the pamphlets might have been written yesterday for all the evidence that they show of bygone modes it is a fashion nowadays to decry the party system in politics once upon a time so the argument runs party names stood for something real they marked fundamental and irreconcilable differences of opinion on essential questions but now they have become empty of meaning the pretexts of competitors for power and reward such an account of the party system is not good history swift who lived when the succession to the crown was a party question made light of whig and tory and here at the very birth of the system is halifax its most destructive critic the names of whig and tory do not occur in his works he disliked devotion in a conventicle and loyalty in a drunken club he was troubled to see men of all sides sick of a calenture he knew that men though they forget much never forget themselves and that the world is nothing but vanity cut out into several shapes his remarks of parties in his political thoughts and reflections are the severest things ever said about party it turneth all thought into talking instead of doing men get a habit of being unuseful to the public by turning in a circle of wrangling and railing which they cannot get out of ignorance maketh most men go into a party and shame keepeth them from getting out of it the fact is that the rigors of party which are easily maintained with all their consequences by logicians journalists and theorists will not suffer the practical test men exalt themselves on their principles and glory in the partition which separates the sheep from the goats who prove after all to be only the other sheep but the english have a genius for government and when government is the business in hand this separatist method has no value men who differ rabidly on principles will find that the lessons they learn from experience have a tendency to be the same then if they change their course or modify the policy which has been so bravely announced they are accused of being false the charge is true they have been false but it was their thinking and talking that was false not their corrected action the melodrama of their boastful creed would not bear translation into the life of this world they have been the dupes of literature 
all that is heroic in literature is simple and straightforward but then the hero is prepared to die society is not prepared to die for a creed and politics is a vast complex network of means to an end the end being the continued life and comfort of mankind it is the irony of the statesman's position that while his work is very like the work of a good housekeeper the literary deceits and fictions incident to the process of persuasion invite us to regard him as a hero of romance a lone figure on a mountain peak silhouetted against the moon i think it's the novels said the old lady quoted by mr badgett that make my girls so heady the old political families of england who have borne a hand for generations in the government of the country are often exempt from these errors they are not easily intoxicated by public duties which have been their matter-of-fact business for centuries you may call them whig or tory it makes little difference some third name more fundamental in its implications is needed to describe them they look at things instinctively from the point of view of the administration the fervors of the pulpit and the platform do not much delight them it was the great advantage of george savile that he was born into such a family and was connected by kinship or by the accidents of life with many of the most influential persons of that age sir henry savile wit and scholar warden of merton college oxford and provost of eton perhaps the most learned greek scholar of elizabethan england was his distant kinsman the lord keeper coventry was his grandfather the great earl of strafford was his father's uncle anthony ashley cooper first earl of shaftesbury who vies with one other claimant for the credit of being the first whig was his uncle by marriage his colleague and in the end his rival lady dorothy sidney waller's saccharissa was his wife's mother more notable still the famous earl of chesterfield was his grandson in short he was intimately connected with most of those whose names fill the pages of english history during the latter part of the seventeenth century and was a witness of the events of that history from a position of extraordinary vantage his family moreover though staunchly royalist managed to keep possession of its estates and in sixteen forty three when his father sir william savile after loyal service rendered to the king died at the age of thirty-one the young george savile had the ball at his feet concerning his youth and education we know next to nothing he was born in sixteen thirty three and was brought up under the control of his widowed mother who was a woman of strong character when she died in sixteen sixty two her son was already married settled on his estate of rufford in nottingshire and prominent in public life note one all who concern themselves with halifax must acknowledge their great debt to the careful and exhaustive work of miss foxcroft the life and letters of sir george savile bart first marquis of salifax etc with a new edition of his works now for the first time collected and revised by h c foxcroft two volumes longmans eighteen ninety eight end of note one he was described later by evelyn the diarist as a very rich man very witty and in his younger days somewhat positive his wit and his riches he kept throughout life his opinions became less positive his wit was perhaps his chief fault he could not keep it under or refuse himself a pointed jest one great argument says a contemporary account of the prodigious depth and quickness of his sense is that many of his observations and wise sayings were on the sudden when talking to a friend or going from him the spontaneity and freedom of his talk was ill taken by clarendon and other cautious and explanatory persons and savile was reputed to be void of all sense of religion which he certainly was not later among his moral thoughts and reflections he says 
there is so much danger in talking that a man strictly wise can hardly be called a sociable creature this was a lesson that he learned but slowly if indeed he ever learned it his conduct of business was discreet almost to a fault his letters are so prudent and reserved that they are amazingly dull to read but he indemnified himself for these restraints by the freedom of his intimate conversation the writings in which he has allowed himself most of this freedom were either non-political like his advice to a daughter or were posthumously published like his character of king charles the second and political moral and miscellaneous thoughts and reflections these are the best of his works that prudence and discretion which keeps a man safe and sequestered in life conceals him also from the notice of later generations the same caution which delivers him from malicious gossip puts him beyond the reach of posthumous sympathy halifax the author appeals to our interest because he says many things which politicians know and do not say to avoid even paltry enmities may be the clear duty of a statesman it is a misfortune halifax remarks for a man not to have a friend in the world but for that reason he shall have no enemy the events of his public life as parliamentary leader as minister under charles the second as president of the council under james the second and as lord privy seal under william the third are written broad on the history of england and cannot be recorded here he bore a hand in all the chief events of the time from the restoration onwards to his death in sixteen ninety five his importance may be well measured by this that it never depended on the office that he held he was respected consulted and feared in opposition no less than when he was chief minister of the crown the greatest of his achievements it will probably be agreed was the rejection of the exclusion act in sixteen eighty by the house of lords no record remains of the speeches made but the severity and brilliance of his duel with shaftesbury is attested by many contemporaries he stood up to shaftesbury and answered him every time he spoke he carried the house in the end triumphantly with him it was a triumph not so much of argument as of intelligence and insight he understood the temper of the people of england as shaftesbury never did and he knew that the ebullitions of popular enthusiasm are no safe index to that temper monmouth was adored by the people the duke of york was neither liked nor loved shaftesbury thought to earn the nation's gratitude by offering them monmouth in place of york he miscalculated cruelly the people did not fear a new king but they did fear a king-maker the whole edifice of constitutional monarchy was designed not for the protection of bad kings but for the humiliation of arrogant ministers this halifax understood so he became the guardian of the constitution and later when james the second had set himself to break the constitution the guiding spirit of the revolution his politics are our politics his political creed remains in the twentieth century what it was in the seventeenth century the creed of john bull but the rare delight is to find john bull a wit wit is commonly employed in extremes where it works most easily to satirize novelty and ridicule all that is unfamiliar or reversing the process to ridicule all that is familiar to deny the truth of proverbs and to flout the sayings that embody general opinion these devices furnish wit with a simple and effective mechanism but halifax employs the subtlest resources of wit in defense of the practical expedient the middle course the reasonable compromise dryden pays tribute in absalom and achitophel not only to the wit of halifax but to his courage and eloquence jotham of piercing wit and pregnant thought endued by nature and by learning taught to move assemblies who but only tried the worse a while then chose the better side 
nor chose alone but turned the balance too so much the weight of one brave man can do indeed for all that he is called the trimmer halifax has been very generally recognized for an upright and honorable man he was promoted by steady gradation to high honors and high offices yet no one has been found foolish enough to pretend that he was a self-seeker macaulay who expresses some distrust of him in the essays and introduces him in the history as one who was not sufficiently indifferent to titles of honor makes amends in a later passage by a full and generous eulogy what distinguishes him from all other english statesmen is this that through a long public life and through frequent and violent revolutions of public feeling he almost invariably took that view of the great question of his time which history has finally adopted he was called inconstant because the relative position in which he stood to the contending factions was perpetually varying as well might the pole star be called inconstant because it is sometimes to the east and sometimes to the west of the pointers to have defended the ancient and legal constitution of the realm against a seditious populace at one conjunction and against a tyrannical government at another to have been the foremost champion of order in the turbulent parliament of sixteen eighty and the foremost champion of liberty in the servile parliament of sixteen eighty five to have been just and merciful to roman catholics in the days of the popish plot and to the exclusionists in the days of the rye house plot to have done all in his power to save both the head of stafford and the head of russell this was a course which contemporaries heated by passion might not unnaturally call fickle but which deserves a very different name from the later justice of posterity one stain and one only macaulay finds on his memory that in the reign of william the third he stooped to hold communication with the exiled court of st germain the fact is not disputed but a wise judgment on the fact asks for a more active and careful imagination than is usually brought to it the black-and-white school of moralists are not valuable critics of the politics of the seventeenth century they would be better employed in writing laudatory biographies of the authors of histriomastics and greek title royal icon for many years it was not certain who was king of england it was not certain whether england was to be a monarchy or a commonwealth many patriotic englishmen had been driven abroad and hardly a man of note had not relatives in france in these civil conflicts which divide families the law of treason must needs be humanely interpreted and the offence proved against halifax amounts only to misprision of treason that is to say he did not cut off all confidential relations with his friends and acquaintance on the other side this at any rate is certain he never for one moment sought any other end than the security and greatness of england he very early recognized that one portentous question was beginning to obscure the whole political horizon the greatness of france wrote the english envoy at lisbon as i have heard your lordship observe hath made all old politics useless so in sixteen sixty eight he welcomed the triple alliance between england holland and sweden to hold louis the fourteenth in check so far his politics were the politics of william of orange but william of orange was a european statesman and general halifax was purely an englishman he was glad to have the help of alliances but he did not like to have to trust to them real friendships between nations are things of very slow and difficult growth while friendships between governments are subject to the dangers and disadvantages of friendships between two bodies of trustees representing different interests if such friendships are immutable they are dishonest halifax was not deceived by them in a letter to sir william temple written shortly before the triple alliance was concluded 
he discusses the possibility of a french invasion and concludes we must rely upon the oak and courage of england to do our business there being small appearance of anything to help us from abroad many fine things have been said of england by englishmen none of them more sincere and moving than the things said by halifax he is a quiet writer critical and skeptical keenly aware of the absurdity of enthusiasm he keeps his feelings so well in hand that he has the reputation of a cynic but this is how he writes of england our trimmer is far from idolatry in other things in one thing only he cometh near it his country is in some degree his idol he doth not worship the sun because tis not peculiar to us it rambles about the world and is less kind to us than others but for the earth of england though perhaps inferior to that of many places abroad to him there is divinity in it and he would rather die than see a spire of english grass trampled down by a foreign trespasser he thinketh there are a great many of his mind for all plants are apt to taste of the soil in which they grow and we that grow here have a root that produceth in us a stalk of english juice which is not to be changed by grafting or foreign infusion and i do not know whether any thing less will prevail than the modern experiment by which the blood of one creature is transmitted into another according to which before the french blood can be let into our bodies every drop of our own must be drawn out of them when these words were written england stood in greater danger of invasion than she has known at any later time unless it were in the time of napoleon halifax had seen the navy driven off the sea by the dutch and the shipping in the thames burnt yet the people were slow to awake to their danger in the pamphlet entitled a rough draft of a new model at sea which was published in sixteen ninety four but was probably written earlier he tries to awaken them he knew the difficulty of the attempt a nation is a great while he observes before they can see and generally they must feel first before their sight is quite cleared this maketh it so long before they can see their interest that for the most part it is too late for them to pursue it if men must be supposed always to follow their true interest it must be meant of a new manufactory of mankind by god almighty there must be some new clay the old stuff never yet made any such infallible creature yet the means to safety was clear and he puts it in the forefront of his argument i will make no other introduction to the following discourse than that as the importance of our being strong at sea was ever very great so in our present circumstances it is grown to be much greater because as formerly our force of shipping contributed greatly to our trade and safety so now it is become indispensably necessary to our very being it may be said now to england martha martha thou art busy about many things but one thing is necessary to the question what shall we do to be saved in this world there is no other answer but this look to your moat the first article of an englishman's political creed must be that he believeth in the sea etc without that there needeth no general counsel to pronounce him incapable of salvation here this is all very modern and so also are his recommendations in the matter of commissions in the navy it is perhaps no bad vindication of his opinions that they are in complete agreement with the best practice of the navy from that time to this there were those who held that all naval officers should be gentlemen born as there were others who held that they should all be tarpaulins that is men who had been bred from boyhood to the rough work of practical seamen 
he discusses the merits and faults of both sorts of officer and rejects both proposals as evil extremes there must be a mixture he holds of the two classes in a proportion to be determined by experiment and circumstance and the dangers that may attend the mixture are to be avoided by one main precaution the gentlemen shall not be capable of bearing office at sea except they be tarpaulins too that is to say except they are so trained up by a continued habit of living at sea that they may have a right to be admitted free denizens of wapping there must be an end of sending idle young noblemen to sea in positions of authority when a gentleman is preferred at sea the tarpaulin is very apt to impute it to friend or favor but if that gentleman hath before his preferment passed through all the steps which lead to it so that he smelleth as much of pitch and tar as those that were swaddled in sailcloth his having an escutcheon will be so far from doing him harm that it will set him upon the advantage ground it will draw a real respect to his quality when so supported and give him an influence and authority infinitely superior to that which the mere seaman can ever pretend to a sailor can never be fit to command till he has learned to obey nor can he be trusted to inflict punishment to which he has never been liable when the undistinguished disciple of a ship hath tamed the young mastership which is apt to arise from a gentleman's birth and education he then groweth proud in the right place and valueth himself first upon knowing his duty and then upon doing it the experience of the two wars with holland had plentifully illustrated the evils of which halifax speaks it was his own knowledge of human nature which directed him so clearly to the remedy the works of halifax all belong to the last ten years or so of his life the earliest of them the character of a trimmer is a complete handbook to the politics of the closing years of charles the second's reign the letter to a dissenter and the anatomy of an equivalent which followed it within a few months are directed against james the second's famous attempt to buy off the hostility of the dissenters by including them in his project of toleration none of these tracts when first printed bore the author's name the naval tract mentioned above and the tract entitled some cautions offered to the consideration of those who are to choose members to serve for the ensuing parliament are also anonymous and are his latest writings when the ensuing parliament came to be elected he had been six months dead all his worldly wisdom shines in this last tract which again applies almost without change to the circumstances of the day the last satirical injunction has a strangely familiar ring in the meantime after having told my opinion who ought not to be chosen if i should be asked who ought to be my answer must be choose englishmen and when i have said that to deal honestly i will not undertake that they are easy to be found in some ways his advice to a daughter which alone among the writings published during his lifetime seems to have been carefully prepared by his own hand for the press is the most attractive of his works it was written for his daughter elizabeth who became the wife of the third earl of chesterfield and the mother of a famous son the habit of giving advice to the younger generation would appear to have been hereditary in the family but halifax's social maxims are more profound than chesterfield's as his political maxims are more profound than bolingbroke's the book was immensely popular it ran through some twenty-five editions and held the field for almost a century to be superseded at last by dr gregory's father's legacy and mrs chapone's letters on the improvement of the mind the advice is somewhat melancholy in tone the author sets before his daughter no ideas of self-advancement and indulges her with scant hopes of happiness 
there is too little room in his scheme for the holiday virtues and the free play of impulse whilst you are playing full of innocence the spiteful world will bite except you are guarded by your caution his words are prophylactic against the inevitable ills of life his section on a husband is devoted mainly to considerations which may palliate a husband's faults and vices his commandments are commandments without promise there is to be no relaxation life is one long fencing bout you are to have as strict a guard upon yourself amongst your children as if you were amongst your enemies this is a wide remark but it does not make home seem a place of warmth and ease the same cold good sense and discernment govern his thinking on such topics as religion and friendship he is judicious sane and balanced but he does not think of the world as a cheerful place yet with all this there is something very moving in his solicitude his high principles of conduct and his deep affection for his daughter peep out unwittingly here and there it is small wonder that the book was cherished by her and lay always upon her table the calm of the perfectly well-bred style forbids all direct expression of the emotions but the impression it makes is all the greater when my fears prevail i shrink as if i was struck at the prospect of danger to which a young woman must be exposed his concluding advice on the article of marriage has a pathos of its own that you would as much as nature will give you leave endeavor to forget the great indulgence you have found at home after such a gentle discipline as you have been under everything you dislike will seem the harsher to you the tenderness we have had for you my dear is of another nature peculiar to kind parents and differing from that which you will meet with first in any family into which you shall be transplanted and yet they may be very kind too and afford no justifiable reason to you to complain you must not be frightened with the first appearances of a differing scene for when you are used to it you may like the house you go to better than that you left and your husband's kindness will have so much advantage of ours that we shall yield up all competition and as well as we love you be very well contented to surrender to such a rival something of the same fragrance makes itself felt in the worldly wisdom of his advice concerning censure the triumph of wit is to make your good nature subdue your censure to be quick in seeing faults and slow in exposing them you are to consider that the invisible thing called a good name is made up of the breadth of numbers that speak well of you so that if by a disobliging word you silence the meanest the gale will be less strong which is to bear up your esteem and though nothing is so vain as the eager pursuit of empty applause yet to be well thought of and to be kindly used by the world is like a glory about a woman's head tis a perfume she carrieth about with her and leaveth wherever she goeth tis a charm against ill-will malice may empty her quiver but cannot wound the dirt will not stick the jests will not take without the consent of the world a scandal doth not go deep it is only a slight stroke upon the injured party and returneth with the greater force upon those that gave it the character of king charles the second is a masterpiece perhaps no such intimate portrait of an english king drawn by a contemporary is to be found in the whole course of our history it makes us regret that halifax has left us so few descriptions of the persons whom he knew the tendency to aphorism and epigram is strong and the character is full of brilliant sentences men given to dissembling are like rooks at play they will cheat for shillings they are so used to it 
mistresses are in all respects craving creatures but the dispassionate analysis of the king's character and motives the accounts given of the effect of his early misfortune on his disposition and the incidental pictures for those who read between the lines of the daily life of the court all these are as convincing as a scientific demonstration the king's ruling passion the love of ease was never so vividly drawn nothing to him was worth purchasing at the price of a difficulty we see him surrounded by a crowd of importunate beggars of both sexes he would walk fast to avoid being engaged by them he would slide from an asking face and could guess very well when he was brought to bay he would buy off his tormentors by large concessions for the sake of present ease in this way the king was made the instrument to defraud the crown which is somewhat extraordinary it is plain to see for all the delicacy with which the royal foibles are described that lord halifax was not perfectly happy in the familiar company that the king kept about him his mistresses were such as did not care that wit of the best kind should have the precedence in their apartments the king delighted in broad illusions and made fun of those who would not join in he had a good memory but told stories too often and at too great length he appreciated wit but and here is a cry from the soul of all men that ever liked those who had wit he could the best endure those who had none yet the natural amiability and sweetness of charles's temper shines through all the description there is a certain attractiveness in his impatience of the formalities of his position his tendency to relapse into charles stuart and so regain the freedom of a private estate the closing eulogy on this unfortunate and gentle prince is a sincere and true testimony from a competent witness a prince neither sharpened by his misfortunes whilst abroad nor by his power when restored is such a shining character that it is a reproach not to be so dazzled with it as not to be able to see a fault in its full light he is under the protection of common frailty that must engage men for their own sakes not to be too severe where they themselves have so much to answer the political moral and miscellaneous thoughts and reflections is the most notable english collection of maxims the nearest parallel and rival to the work of la rochefoucauld and la bruyere popular proverbs it has often been remarked are not very generous in their treatment of humanity and a writer of aphorisms which are proverbs coined in a private mint is open to the same charge an aphorism is an act of judgment and so can pretend to no higher merit than justice which is not the greatest of human virtues the beauties of human character are vague and living things the deformities lend themselves more readily to be outlined by a decisive pencil yet the aphorisms of halifax never sacrifice sense to wit and always provoke thought his political reflections especially could only have been written by a statesman of experience he is often severe but he is no cynic men must be saved in this world he says by their want of faith but he was not so foolish as to deny the existence of unselfishness it is a mistake to say a friend can be bought in his character of king charles the second commenting on the insatiability of the king's followers he falls into the same vein of argument i am of an opinion in which i am every day more confirmed by observation that gratitude is one of those things that cannot be bought it must be born with men or else all the obligations in the world will not create it an outward show may be made to satisfy decency and to prevent reproach 
but a real sense of a kind thing is a gift of nature and never was nor can be acquired yet even sincere friendship has its weaknesses those friends who are above interest are seldom above jealousy the aphorisms of halifax are a better guide to the world as it is than all the brilliances of his epigrammatic french contemporaries his satire bears no trace of disappointed ambition or poisoned egotism some of his sayings are condensed treatises in their weight of thought why is it that popularity is so often suspect he puts his finger at once on the answer popularity is a crime from the moment it is sought it is only a virtue when men have it whether they will or no who has ever defined a fool better than in these words a fool hath no dialogue within himself the first thought carrieth him without the reply of a second how could the verdict of mankind on plaintive persons be more truly expressed than in the sentences on complaint complaining is a contempt upon one's self it is an ill sign both of a man's head and of his heart a man throweth himself down whilst he complaineth and when a man throweth himself down no body careth to take him up again there is very little mention made of halifax in the writings of his contemporaries though he held a conspicuous station he seems to have passed through life observing rather than observed a fascinating sketch of him is given in burnett's history of his own time as he appeared to that prelate of unbounded energy and coarse perceptions virtue may win over vice but intelligence cannot make a convert of stupidity burnett whose power in the state came late in halifax's career is a good example of the bluff hot-headed partisan to whom it is impossible to doubt that right is all on one side halifax we are told by a contemporary was never better pleased than when he was turning bishop burnett and his politics into ridicule burnett's verdict on halifax will not mislead those who have heard the trimmer speak for himself he was a man of a great and ready wit full of life and very pleasant much turned to satire he let his wit run much on matters of religion so that he passed for a bold and determined atheist though he often protested to me he was not one and said he believed there was not one in the world he was a christian in submission he believed as much as he could and he hoped that god would not lay it to his charge if he could not digest iron as an ostrich did nor take into his belief things that must burst him if he had any scruples they were not sought for nor cherished by him for he never read an atheistical book in a fit of sickness i knew him very much touched with a sense of religion i was then often with him he seemed full of good purposes but they went off with his sickness he was always talking of morality and friendship he was punctual in all payments and just in all his private dealings but with relation to the public he went backwards and forwards and changed sides so often that in conclusion no side trusted him he seemed full of commonwealth notions yet he went into the worst part of king charles reign he is the last of the long line of statesmen who found it possible to govern england without paying allegiance to a party their day is past and the party system is stronger now than it was in the time of the jacobites and hanoverians no better method has ever been devised for the peaceful settlement of differences of opinion on domestic questions the nation is not prepared to revive the custom of impeaching unpopular ministers Englishmen sometimes rail at party as they rail at cricket and football but they know that there is no escape from it it deceives vainglorious partisans no doubt and it offends righteous philosophers but it suits the national temper yet there is no need to be duped by it and any one who tries to think clearly on politics must be a very wise man 
or a very foolish one, if he gets no help from the writings of the Marquis of Halifax. It remains to say a few words on the text of Halifax. The present edition is based on the two volumes which together contain the works of Halifax, namely the volume of Miscellanies, first published in 1700, and the volume entitled A Character of King Charles the Second, and Political, Moral, and Miscellaneous Thoughts and Reflections, published in 1750. For these last two pieces, the 1750 volume is the sole authority. It was printed from material supplied by Lady Burlington, Halifax's granddaughter, and seems to be virtually free from mistakes. The advice to a daughter, which is included in the miscellanies, is likewise a good and careful text. Some few variations occur among the many editions of this piece, but they are of very little importance. Of the political tracts there are, of course, many separate editions earlier than the miscellanies. These tracts were most of them first circulated in manuscript, and I cannot convince myself that any one of them, when it came to be printed, was overseen by the author. It may be, as Miss Foxcroft suggests, that he corrected the proofs of the anatomy of an equivalent, but against this it must be said that men of quality rarely corrected proofs, and that the character of a trimmer, a much more important and personal document, appeared in print again and again during his lifetime, full of nonsensical mistakes, which varied from edition to edition, but did not diminish in number. There is no authoritative edition of any of the controversial writings, but the variations in the earlier editions of the shorter tracts are unimportant, and the obvious blunders are comparatively few. The only serious textual difficulties are presented by the character of a trimmer. This piece seems, from the first, to have been the plaything of copyists and printers. Miss Foxcroft, in her admirable edition, has collated the various printed texts, and has compared them in detail with four manuscript copies. But the manuscripts are not more trustworthy or less corrupt than the printed editions, so that the result is disappointing. Some of the best emendations in her text are suggested by herself. Some are borrowed from manuscripts. I desire to express my obligations for the readings which I owe to her edition, notably discountenance for distinct name, infra, page 58, L21, and, best of all, spire of English grass for piece of English glass, page 97, L18. This last emendation has restored its highest touch of imagination to the finest passage in the tract. I have resisted the temptation to suggest important emendations. Once only I have yielded to it, and have read Landlord for Language on page 84, L20. The reading Language would leave to the sentence a possible meaning, but would make nonsense of the argument. It is a significant fact that this reading, which I take to be an obvious blunder, is found in all the editions, and in all the manuscripts. Miss Foxcroft has taken a hint from the manuscripts, and has restored the inflection eth, or th, in the third person singular of the present tense. In this I have followed her example. There is no doubt that the termination in s, or s, was substituted by the printers for the old-fashioned usage, which was preferred by Halifax in his authoritative works, and which is necessary for the cadence of his sentences. I have followed my printed originals in the matter of capitals and italics. I have also preserved the old punctuation, correcting it only in those few instances where it seemed to be wrong judged by its own principles. The modern usage in all these matters sacrifices everything to naked logic, and substitutes bare outline for the delicate emotional shading of the older fashion. Walter Raleigh, Oxford, 1912 End of Introduction to the Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquess of Halifax Read by John Greenman
This is Chapter One of the Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Greenman. The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. Chapter One The Lady's New Year's Gift, or Advice to a Daughter. Part One: Introduction and Religion Dear daughter, I find that even our most pleasing thoughts will be unquiet. They will be in motion, and the mind can have no rest whilst it is possessed by a darling passion. You are at present the chief object of my care, as well as of my kindness which sometimes throweth me into visions of your being happy in the world, that are better suited for my partial wishes than to my reasonable hopes for you. At other times, when my fears prevail, I shrink as if I was struck at the prospect of danger to which a young woman must be exposed. But how much the more lively, so much the more liable you are to be hurt as the finest plants are the soonest nipped by the frost whilst you are playing full of innocence the spiteful world will bite except you are guarded by your caution want of care therefore my dear child is never to be excused since as to this world it hath the same effect as want of virtue such an early sprouting wit requireth so much the more to be sheltered by some rules, like something strewed on tender flowers, to preserve them from being blasted. You must take it well to be pruned by so kind a hand as that of a father. There may be some bitterness in mere obedience. The natural love of liberty may help to make the commands of a parent harder to go down. Some inward resistance there will be where power and not choice maketh us move but when a father layeth aside his authority and persuadeth only by his kindness he will never answer it to good nature if it hath not weight with you a great part of what is said in the following discourse may be above the present growth of your understanding but that becoming every day taller will in a little time reach up to it, so as to make it easy to you. I am willing to begin with you before your mind is quite formed, that being the time in which it is most capable of receiving a color that will last when it is mixed with it. Few things are well learnt, but by early precepts those well infused make them natural, and we are never sure of retaining what is valuable till by a continued habit we have made it a piece of us whether my skill can draw the picture of a fine woman may be a question but it can be none that i have drawn that of a kind father if you will take an exact copy i will so far presume upon my workmanship as to undertake you shall not make an ill figure give me so much credit as to try and I am sure that neither your wishes nor mine shall be disappointed by it. RELIGION The first thing to be considered is religion. It must be the chief object of your thoughts, since it would be a vain thing to direct your behavior in the world and forget that which you are to have towards him who made it. In a strict sense, it is the only thing necessary. You must take it into your mind, and from thence throw it into your heart, where you are to embrace it so close as never to lose the possession of it. But then it is necessary to distinguish between the reality and the pretense. Religion doth not consist in believing the legend of the nursery where children with their milk are fed with the tales of witches, hobgoblings, prophecies, and miracles. We suck in so greedily these early mistakes 
that our riper understanding hath much ado to cleanse our minds from this kind of trash the stories are so entertaining that we do not only believe them but relate them which makes the discovery of the truth somewhat grievous when it makes us lose such a field of impertinence where we might have diverted ourselves besides the throwing some shame upon us for having ever received them this is making the world a jest and imputing to god almighty that the province he assigneth to the devil is to play at blind man's buff and show tricks with mankind and is so far from being religion that it is not sense and hath right only to be called that kind of devotion of which ignorance is the undoubted mother without competition or dispute these mistakes are therefore to be left off with your hanging sleeves and you ought to be as much out of countenance to be found with them about you as to be seen playing with babies at an age when other things are expected from you the next thing to be observed to you is that religion doth as little consist in loud answers and devout convulsions at church or praying in an extraordinary manner some ladies are so extreme stirring at church that one would swear the worm in their conscience made them so unquiet others will have such a divided face between a devout goggle and an inviting glance that the unnatural mixture maketh even the best looks to be at that time ridiculous these affected appearances are ever suspected like very strong perfumes which are generally thought no very good symptoms in those that make use of them let your earnestness therefore be reserved for your closet where you may have god almighty to yourself in public be still and calm neither undecently careless nor affected in the other extreme it is not true devotion to put on an angry zeal against those who may be of a differing persuasion partiality to ourselves makes us often mistake it for a duty to fall hard upon others in that case and being pushed on by self-conceit we strike without mercy believing that the wounds we give are meritorious and that we are fighting god almighty's quarrel when the truth is we are only setting out ourselves our devotion too often breaketh out into that shape which most agreeth with our particular temper the choleric grow into a hardened severity against all who dissent from them snatch at all the texts of scripture that suit with their complexion and because god's wrath was some time kindled they conclude that anger is a divine virtue and are so far from imagining their ill-natured zeal requireth an apology that they value themselves upon it and triumph in it others whose nature is more credulous than ordinary admit no bounds or measure to it they grow as proud of extending their faith as princes are of enlarging their dominions not considering that our faith like our stomach is capable of being overcharged and that as the last is destroyed by taking in more than it can digest so our reason may be extinguished by oppressing it with the weight of too many strange things especially if we are forbidden to chew what we are commanded to swallow the melancholy and the sullen are apt to place a great part of their religion in dejected or ill-humoured looks putting on an unsociable face and declaiming against the innocent entertainments of life with as much sharpness as they could bestow upon the greatest crimes this generally is only a vizard there is seldom anything real in it no other thing is the better for being sour and it would be hard that religion should be so which is the best of things in the meantime it may be said with truth that this surly kind of devotion hath perhaps done little less hurt in the world by frighting 
than the most scandalous examples have done by infecting it having told you in these few instances to which many more might be added what is not true religion it is time to describe to you what is so the ordinary definitions of it are no more like it than the common signposts are like the princes they would represent the unskilful daubers in all ages have generally laid on such ill colors and drawn such harsh lines that the beauty of it is not easily to be discerned they have put in all the forbidding features that can be thought of and in the first place have made it an irreconcilable enemy to nature when in reality they are not only friends but twins born together at the same time and it is doing violence to them both to go about to have them separated nothing is so kind and so inviting as true and unsophisticated religion instead of imposing unnecessary burdens upon our nature it easeth us of the greater weight of our passions and mistakes instead of subduing us with rigor it redeemeth us from the slavery we are in to ourselves who are the most severe masters whilst we are under the usurpation of our appetites let loose and not restrained religion is a cheerful thing so far from being always at cuffs with good humor that it is inseparably united to it nothing unpleasant belongs to it though the spiritual cooks have done their unskilful part to give an ill relish to it a wise epicure would be religious for the sake of pleasure good sense is the foundation of both and he is a bungler who aimeth at true luxury but where they are joined religion is exalted reason refined and sifted from the grosser parts of it it dwelleth in the upper region of the mind where there are fewest clouds or mists to darken or offend it it is both the foundation and the crown of all virtues it is morality improved and raised to its height by being carried nearer heaven the only place where perfection resideth it cleanseth the understanding and brusheth off the earth that hangeth about our souls it doth not want the hopes and the terrors which are made use of to support it neither ought it to descend to the borrowing any argument out of itself since there we may find everything that should invite us if we were to be hired to religion it is able to outbid the corrupted world with all it can offer to us being so much the richer of the two in everything where reason is admitted to be a judge of the value since this is so it is worth your pains to make religion your choice and not make use of it only as a refuge there are ladies who finding by the too visible decay of their good looks that they can shine no more by that light put on the varnish of an affected devotion to keep up some kind of figure in the world they take sanctuary in the church when they are pursued by growing contempt which will not be stopped but followeth them to the altar such late penitence is only a disguise for the tormenting grief of being no more handsome that is the killing thought which draweth the sighs and tears that appear outwardly to be applied to a better end there are many who have an aguish devotion hot and cold fits long intermissions and violent raptures this unevenness is by all means to be avoided let your method be a steady course of good life that may run like a smooth stream and be a perpetual spring to furnish to the continued exercise of virtue your devotion may be earnest but it must be unconstrained and like other duties you must make it your pleasure too or else it will have very little efficacy by this rule you may best judge of your own heart whilst those duties are joys it is an evidence of their being sincere but when they are a penance it is a sign that your nature maketh some resistance 
and whilst that lasteth you can never be entirely secure of yourself if you are often unquiet and too nearly touched by the cross accidents of life your devotion is not of the right standard there is too much allay in it that which is right and unmixed taketh away the sting of everything that would trouble you it is like a healing balm that extinguisheth the sharpness of the blood so this softeneth and dissolveth the anguish of the mind a devout mind hath the privilege of being free from passions as some climates are from all venomous kind of creatures it will raise you above the little vexations to which others for want of it will be exposed and bring you to a temper not of stupid indifference but of such a wise resignation that you may live in the world so as it may hang about you like a loose garment and not be tied too close to you take heed of running into that common error of applying god's judgments upon particular occasions our weights and measures are not competent to make the distribution either of his mercy or his justice he hath thrown a veil over these things which make it not only an impertinence but a kind of sacrilege for us to give sentence in them without his commission as to your particular faith keep to the religion that has grown up with you both as it is the best in itself and that the reason of staying in it upon that ground is somewhat stronger for your sex than it will perhaps be allowed to be for ours in respect that the voluminous inquiries into the truth by reading are less expected from you the best of books will be direction enough to you not to change and whilst you are fixed and sufficiently confirmed in your own mind you will do best to keep vain doubts and scruples at such a distance that they may give you no disquiet let me recommend to you a method of being rightly informed which can never fail it is in short this get understanding and practice virtue and if you are so blessed as to have those for your share it is not sure that there is a god than it is that by him all necessary truths will be revealed to you end of section one of advice to a daughter religion this is section o two of the complete works of george saville advice to a daughter husband this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. Read by John Greenman. Section 2. Advice to a Daughter. Husband. That which challengeth the next place in your thoughts is how to live with a husband and though that is so large a word that few rules can be fixed to it which are unchangeable the methods being as various as the several tempers of men to which they must be suited yet i cannot omit some general observations which with the help of your own may the better direct you in the part of your life upon which your happiness most dependeth it is one of the disadvantages belonging to your sex that young women are seldom permitted to make their own choice their friends care and experience are thought safer guides to them than their own fancies and their modesty often forbiddeth them to refuse when their parents recommend though their inward consent may not entirely go along with it in this case there remaineth nothing for them to do but to endeavor to make that easy which falleth to their lot and by a wise use of every thing they may dislike in a husband turn that by degrees to be very supportable which if neglected might in time beget an aversion you must first lay it down for a foundation in general that there is inequality in the sexes and that for the better o economy of the world the men who were to be the law-givers had the larger share of reason bestowed upon them 
by which means your sex is the better prepared for the compliance that is necessary for the better performance of those duties which seem to be most properly assigned to it this looks a little uncourtly at the first appearance but upon examination it will be found that nature is so far from being unjust to you that she is partial on your side she hath made you such large amends by other advantages for the seeming injustice of the first distribution that the right of complaining is come over to our sex you have it in your power not only to free yourselves but to subdue your masters and without violence throw both their natural and legal authority at your feet we are made of differing tempers that our defects may the better be mutually supplied your sex wanteth our reason for your conduct and our strength for your protection ours wanteth your gentleness to soften and to entertain us the first part of our life is a good deal subjected to you in the nursery where you reign without competition and by that means have the advantage of giving the first impressions afterwards you have stronger influences which well managed have more force in your behalf than all our privileges and jurisdictions can pretend to have against you you have more strength in your looks than we have in our laws and more power by your tears than we have by our arguments it is true that the laws of marriage run in a harsher style towards your sex obey is an ungenteel word and less easy to be digested by making such an unkind distinction in the words of the contract and so very unsuitable to the excess of good manners which generally goes before it besides the universality of the rule seemeth to be a grievance and it appeareth reasonable that there might be an exemption for extraordinary women from ordinary rules to take away the just exception that lieth against the false measure of general equality it may be alleged by the counsel retained by your sex that as there is in all other laws an appeal from the letter to the equity in cases that require it it is as reasonable that some court of a larger jurisdiction might be erected where some wives might resort and plead specially and in such instances where nature is so kind as to raise them above the level of their own sex they might have relief and obtain a mitigation in their own particular of a sentence which was given generally against womankind the causes of separation are now so very coarse that few are confident enough to buy their liberty at the price of having their modesty so exposed and for disparity of minds which above all other things requireth a remedy the laws have made no provision so little refined are numbers of men by whom they are compiled this and a great deal more might be said to give a color to the complaint but the answer to it in short is that the institution of marriage is too sacred to admit a liberty of objecting to it that the supposition of yours being the weaker sex having without all doubt a good foundation maketh it reasonable to subject it to the masculine dominion that no rule can be so perfect as not to admit some exceptions but the law presumeth there would be so few found in this case who would have a sufficient right to such a privilege that it is safer some injustice should be connived at in a very few instances than to break into an establishment upon which the order of humane society doth so much depend you are therefore to make your best of what is settled by law and custom and not vainly imagine that it will be changed for your sake but that you may not be discouraged as if you lay under the weight of an incurable grievance you are to know that by a wise and dexterous conduct it will be in your power to relieve yourself from anything that looketh like a disadvantage in it for your better direction 
i will give a hint of the most ordinary causes of dissatisfaction between man and wife that you may be able by such a warning to live so upon your guard that when you shall be married you may know how to cure your husband's mistakes and to prevent your own first then you are to consider you live in a time which hath rendered some kind of frailties so habitual that they lay claim to large grains of allowance the world in this is somewhat unequal and our sex seemeth to play the tyrant in distinguishing partially for ourselves by making that in the utmost degree criminal in the woman which in a man passeth under a much gentler censure the root and the excuse of this injustice is the preservation of families from any mixture which may bring a blemish to them and whilst the point of honor continues to be so placed it seems unavoidable to give your sex the greater share of the penalty but if in this it lieth under any disadvantage you are more than recompensed by having the honor of families in your keeping the consideration so great a trust must give you maketh full amends and this power the world hath lodged in you can hardly fail to restrain the severity of an ill husband and to improve the kindness and esteem of a good one this being so remember that next to the danger of committing the fault yourself the greatest is that of seeing it in your husband do not seem to look or hear that way if he is a man of sense he will reclaim himself the folly of it is of itself sufficient to cure him if he is not so he will be provoked but not reformed to expostulate in these cases looketh like declaring war and preparing reprisals which to a thinking husband would be a dangerous reflection besides it is so coarse a reason which will be assigned for a lady's too great warmth upon such an occasion that modesty no less than prudence ought to restrain her since such an undecent complaint makes a wife much more ridiculous than the injury that provoketh her to it but it is yet worse and more unskilful to blaze it in the world expecting it should rise up in arms to take her part whereas she will find it can have no other effect than that she will be served up in all companies as the reigning jest at that time and will continue to be the common entertainment till she is rescued by some newer folly that cometh upon the stage and driveth her away from it the impertinence of such methods is so plain that it doth not deserve the pains of being laid open be assured that in these cases your discretion and silence will be the most prevailing reproof an affected ignorance which is seldom a virtue is a great one here and when your husband seeth how unwilling you are to be uneasy there is no stronger argument to persuade him not to be unjust to you besides it will naturally make him more yielding in other things and whether it be to cover or redeem his offence you may have the good effects of it whilst it lasteth and all that while have the most reasonable ground that can be of presuming such a behaviour will at last entirely convert him there is nothing so glorious to a wife as a victory so gained a man so reclaimed is for ever after subjected to her virtue and her bearing for a time is more than rewarded by a triumph that will continue as long as her life the next thing i will suppose is that your husband may love wine more than is convenient it will be granted that though there are vices of a deeper dye there are none that have greater deformity than this when it is not restrained but with all this the same custom which is the more to be lamented for its being so general should make it less uneasy to every one in particular who is to suffer by the effects of it so that in the first place it will be no new thing if you should have a drunkard for your husband and there is by too frequent examples evidence enough that such a thing may happen and yet a wife may live too without being miserable 
self-love dictateth aggravating words to every thing we feel ruin and misery are the terms we apply to whatever we do not like forgetting the mixture allotted to us by the condition of human life by which it is not intended we should be quite exempt from trouble it is fair if we can escape such a degree of it as would oppress us and enjoy so much of the pleasant part as may lessen the ill taste of such things as are unwelcome to us every thing hath two sides and for our own ease we ought to direct our thoughts to that which may be least liable to exception to fall upon the worst side of a drunkard giveth so unpleasant a prospect that it is not possible to dwell upon it let us pass then to the more favorable part as far as a wife is concerned in it i am tempted to say if the irregularity of the expression could in strictness be justified that a wife is to thank god her husband hath faults mark the seeming paradox my dear for your own instruction it being intended no further a husband without faults is a dangerous observer he hath an eye so piercing and seeth everything so plain that it is exposed to his full censure and though i will not doubt but that your virtue will disappoint the sharpest inquiries yet few women can bear the having all they say or do represented in the clear glass of an understanding without faults nothing softeneth the arrogance of our nature like a mixture of some frailties it is by them we are best told that we must not strike too hard upon others because we ourselves do so often deserve blows they pull our rage by the sleeve and whisper gentleness to us in our censures even when they are rightly applied the faults and passions of husbands bring them down to you and make them content to live upon less unequal terms than faultless men would be willing to stoop to so haughty is mankind till humbled by common weaknesses and defects which in our corrupted state contribute more towards the reconciling us to one another than all the precepts of the philosophers and divines so that where the errors of our nature make amends for the disadvantages of yours it is more your part to make use of the benefit than to quarrel at the fault thus in case a drunken husband should fall to your share if you will be wise and patient his wine shall be of your side it will throw a veil over your mistakes and will set out and improve everything you do that he is pleased with others will like him less and by that means he may perhaps like you the more when after having dined too well he is received at home without a storm or so much as a reproaching look the wine will naturally work out all in kindness which a wife must encourage let it be wrapped up in never so much impertinence on the other side it would boil up into rage if the mistaken wife should treat him roughly like a certain thing called a kind of shrew than which the world with all its plenty cannot show a more senseless ill-bred forbidding creature consider that where the man will give such frequent intermissions of the use of his reason the wife insensibly getteth a right of governing in the vacancy and that raiseth her character and credit in the family to a higher pitch than perhaps could be done under a sober husband who never putteth himself into an incapacity of holding the reins if these are not entire consolations at least they are remedies to some degree they cannot make drunkenness a virtue nor a husband given to it a felicity but you will do yourself no ill office in the endeavoring by these means to make the best of such a lot in case it should happen to be yours and by the help of a wise observation to make that very supportable which would otherwise be a load that would oppress you the next case i will put is that your husband may be choleric or ill-humoured to this it may be said 
that passionate men generally make amends at the foot of the account such a man if he is angry one day without any sense will the next day be as kind without any reason so that by marking how the wheels of such a man's head are used to move you may easily bring over all his passion to your party instead of being struck down by his thunder you shall direct it where and upon whom you shall think it best applied thus are the strongest poisons turned to the best remedies but then there must be art in it and a skilful hand else the least bungling maketh it mortal there is a great deal of nice care requisite to deal with a man of this complexion choler proceedeth from pride and maketh a man so partial to himself that he swelleth against contradiction and thinketh he is lessened if he is opposed you must in this case take heed of increasing the storm by an unwary word or kindling the fire whilst the wind is in a corner which may blow it in your face you are dexterously to yield everything till he beginneth to cool and then by slow degrees you may rise and gain upon him your gentleness well timed will like a charm dispel his anger ill-placed a kind smile will reclaim when a shrill pettish answerer would provoke him rather than fail upon such occasions when other remedies are too weak a little flattery may be admitted which by being necessary will cease to be criminal if ill-humor and sullenness and not open and sudden heat is his disease there is a way of treating that too so as to make it a grievance to be endured in order to it you are first to know that naturally good sense hath a mixture of surly in it and there being so much folly in the world and for the most part so triumphant it giveth frequent temptations to raise the spleen of men who think right therefore that which may generally be called ill-humor is not always a fault it becometh one when either it is wrong applied or that it is continued too long when it is not so for this reason you must not too hastily fix an ill name upon that which may perhaps not deserve it and though the case should be that your husband might too sourly resent anything he disliketh it may so happen that more blame shall belong to your mistake than to his ill-humor if a husband behaveth himself sometimes with an indifference that a wife may think offensive she is in the wrong to put the worst sense upon it if by any means it will admit a better some wives will call it ill-humor if their husbands change their style from that which they used whilst they make their first addresses to them others will allow no intermission or abatement in the expressions of kindness to them not enough distinguishing times and forgetting that it is impossible for men to keep themselves up all their lives to the height of some extravagant moments a man may at some times be less careful in little things without any cold or disobliging reason for it as a wife may be too expecting in smaller matters without drawing upon herself the inference of being unkind and if your husband should be really sullen and have such frequent fits as might take away the excuse of it it concerneth you to have an eye prepared to discern the first appearances of the cloudy weather and to watch when the fit goeth off which seldom lasteth long if it is let alone but whilst the mind is sore everything galleth it and that maketh it necessary to let the black humor begin to spend itself before you come in and venture to undertake it if in the lottery of the world you should draw a covetous husband i confess it will not make you proud of your good luck yet even such a one may be endured too though there are few passions more untractable than that of avarice you must first take care that your definition of avarice may not be a mistake you are to examine every circumstance of your husband's fortune 
and weigh the reason of everything you expect from him before you have a right to pronounce that sentence the complaint is now so general against all husbands that it giveth great suspicion of its being often ill-grounded it is impossible they should all deserve that censure and therefore it is certain that it is many times misapplied he that spareth in everything is an inexcusable niggard he that spareth in nothing is as inexcusable a madman the mean is to spare in what is least necessary to lay out more liberally in what is most required in our several circumstances yet this will not always satisfy there are wives who are impatient of the rules of o economy and are apt to call their husband's kindness in question if any other measure is put to their expense than that of their own fancy be sure to avoid this dangerous error such a partiality to yourself which is so offensive to an understanding man that he will very ill bear a wife's giving herself such an injurious preference to all the family and whatever belongeth to it but to admit the worst and that your husband is really a close-handed wretch you must in this as in other cases endeavor to make it less afflicting to you and first you must observe reasonable hours of speaking when you offer anything in opposition to this reigning humor a third hand and a wise friend may often prevail more than you will be allowed to do in your own cause sometimes you are dexterously to go along with him in things where you see that the niggardly part of his mind is most predominant by which you will have the better opportunity of persuading him in things where he may be more indifferent our passions are very unequal and are apt to be raised or lessened according as they work upon different objects they are not to be stopped or restrained in those things where our mind is more particularly engaged in other matters they are more tractable and will sometimes give reason a hearing and admit a fair dispute more than that there are few men even in this instance of avarice so entirely abandoned to it that at some hours and upon some occasions will not forget their natures and for that time turn prodigal the same man who will grudge himself what is necessary let his pride be raised and he shall be profuse at another time his anger shall have the same effect a fit of vanity ambition and sometimes of kindness shall open and enlarge his narrow mind a dose of wine will work upon this tough humor and for the time dissolve it your business must be in if this case happeneth to watch these critical moments and not let one of them slip without making your advantage of it and a wife may be said to want skill if by these means she is not able to secure herself in a good measure against the inconveniences this scurvy quality in a husband might bring upon her except he should be such an incurable monster as i hope will never fall to your share the last supposition i will make is that your husband should be weak and incompetent to make use of the privileges that belong to him it will be yielded that such a one leaveth room for a great many objections but god almighty seldom sendeth a grievance without a remedy or at least such a mitigation as taketh away a great part of the sting and the smart of it to make such a misfortune less heavy you are first to bring to your observation that a wife very often maketh a better figure for her husband's making no great one and there seemeth to be little reason why the same lady that chooseth a waiting woman with worse looks may not be content with a husband with less wit the argument being equal from the advantage of the comparison if you will be more ashamed in some cases of such a husband you will be less afraid than you would perhaps be of a wise one his unseasonable weakness may no doubt sometimes grieve you but then set against this that it giveth you the dominion if you will make the right use of it 
it is next to his being dead in which case the wife hath right to administer therefore be sure if you have such an idiot that none except yourself may have the benefit of the forfeiture such a fool is a dangerous beast if others have the keeping of him and you must be very undexterous if when your husband shall resolve to be an ass you do not take care he may be your ass but you must go skilfully about it and above all things take heed of distinguishing in public what kind of husband he is your inward thoughts must not hinder the outward payment of the consideration that is due to him your slighting him in company besides that it would to a discerning bystander give too great encouragement for the making nearer applications to you is in itself such an undecent way of assuming that it may provoke the tame creature to break loose and to show his dominion for his credit which he was content to forget for his ease in short the surest and the most approved method will be to do like a wise minister to an easy prince first give him the orders you afterwards receive from him with all this that which you are to pray for is a wise husband one that by knowing how to be a master for that very reason will not let you feel the weight of it one whose authority is so softened by his kindness that it giveth you ease without abridging your liberty one that will return so much tenderness to your just esteem of him that you will never want power though you will seldom care to use it such a husband is as much above all the other kinds of them as a rational subjection to a prince great in himself is to be preferred before the disquiet and uneasiness of unlimited liberty before i leave this head i must add a little concerning your behavior to your husband's friends which requireth the most refined part of your understanding to acquit yourself well of it you are to study how to live with them with more care than you are to apply to any other part of your life especially at first that you may not stumble at the first setting out the family into which you are grafted will generally be apt to expect that like a stranger in a foreign country you should conform to their methods and not bring in a new model by your own authority the friends in such case are tempted to rise up in arms as against an unlawful invasion so that you are with the utmost caution to avoid the least appearances of anything of this kind and that you may with less difficulty afterwards give your directions be sure at first to receive them from your husband's friends gain them to you by early applying to them and they will be so satisfied that as nothing is more thankful than pride when it is complied with they will strive which of them shall most recommend you and when they have helped you to take root in your husband's good opinion you will have less dependence upon theirs though you must not neglect any reasonable means of preserving it you are to consider that a man governed by his friends is very easily inflamed by them and that one who is not so will yet for his own sake expect to have them considered it is easily improved to a point of honor in a husband not to have his relations neglected and nothing is more dangerous than to raise an objection which is grounded upon pride it is the most stubborn and lasting passion we are subject to and where it is the first cause of the war it is very hard to make a secure peace your caution in this is of the last importance to you and that you may the better succeed in it carry a strict eye upon the impertinence of your servants take heed that their ill-humor may not engage you to take exceptions or their too much assuming in small matters raise consequences which may bring you under great disadvantage remember that in the case of a royal bride those about her are generally so far suspected to bring in a foreign interest that in most countries they are insensibly reduced to a very small number and those of so low a figure that it doth not admit the being jealous of them in little and in the proportion this may be the case of every new married woman 
and therefore it may be more advisable for you to gain the servants you find in a family than to tie yourself too fast to those you carry into it you are not to overlook these small reflections because they may appear low and inconsiderable for it must be said that as the greatest streams are made up of the small drops at the head of the springs from whence they are derived so the greater circumstances of your life will be in some degree directed by these seeming trifles which having the advantage of being the first acts of it have a greater effect than singly in their own nature they could pretend to i will conclude this article with my advice that you would as much as nature will give you leave endeavor to forget the great indulgence you have found at home after such a gentle discipline as you have been under everything you dislike will seem the harsher to you the tenderness we have had for you my dear is of another nature peculiar to kind parents and differing from that which you will meet with first in any family into which you shall be transplanted and yet they may be very kind too and afford no justifiable reason to you to complain you must not be frighted with the first appearance of a differing scene for when you are used to it you may like the house you go to better than that you left and your husband's kindness will have so much advantage of yours that we shall yield up all competition and as well as we love you be very well contented to surrender to such a rival end of section o two advice to a daughter husband This is section three of the complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. Advice to a daughter. House, family, and children. You must lay before you, my dear, there are degrees of care to recommend yourself to the world in the several parts of your life. In many things, though the doing them well may raise your credit and esteem, yet the omission of them would draw no immediate reproach upon you. In others, where your duty is more particularly applied, the neglect of them is amongst those faults which are not forgiven and will bring you under a censure which will be a much heavier thing than the trouble you would avoid of this kind is the government of your house family and children which since it is the province allotted to your sex and that the discharging it well will for that reason be expected from you if you either desert it out of laziness or manage it ill for want of skill instead of a help you will be an encumbrance to the family where you are placed i must tell you that no respect is lasting but that which is produced by our being in some degree useful to those that pay it where that faileth the homage and the reverence go along with it and fly to others where something may be expected in exchange for them and upon this principle the respects even of the children and the servants will not stay with one that doth not think them worth their care and the old housekeeper shall make a better figure in the family than the lady with all her fine clothes if she wilfully relinquishes her title to the government therefore take heed of carrying your good breeding to such a height as to be good for nothing and to be proud of it some think it hath a great air to be above troubling their thoughts with such ordinary things as their house and family others dare not admit cares for fear they should hasten wrinkles mistaken pride maketh some think they must keep themselves up and not descend to these duties which do not seem enough refined for great ladies to be employed in forgetting all this while that it is more than the greatest princes can do at once to preserve the respect and to neglect their business no age ever erected altars to insignificant gods 
they had all some quality applied to them to draw worship from mankind this maketh it the more unreasonable for a lady to expect to be considered and at the same time resolve not to deserve it good looks alone will not do they are not much a lasting tenure as to be relied upon and if they should stay longer than they usually do it will by no means be safe to depend upon them for when time hath abated the violence of the first liking and that the nap is a little worn off though still a good degree of kindness may remain men recover their sight which before might be dazzled and allow themselves to object as well as to admire in such a case when a husband seeth an empty airy thing sail up and down the house to no kind of purpose and look as if she came thither only to make a visit when he findeth that after her emptiness hath been extreme busy about some very senseless thing she eats her breakfast half an hour before dinner to be at greater liberty to afflict the company with her discourse then calleth for her coach that she may trouble her acquaintance who are already cloyed with her and having some proper dialogues ready to display her foolish eloquence at the top of the stairs she setteth out like a ship out of the harbour laden with trifles and cometh back with them at her return she repeateth to her faithful waiting woman the triumphs of that day's impertinence then wrapped up in flattery and clean linen goeth to bed so satisfied that it throweth her into pleasant dreams of her own felicity such a one is seldom serious but with her tailor her children and family may now and then have a random thought but she never taketh aim but at something very impertinent i say when a husband whose province is without doors and to whom the economy of the house would be in some degree indecent findeth no order nor quiet in his family meeteth with complaints of all kinds springing from this root the mistaken lady who thinketh to make amends for all this by having a well-chosen petticoat will at last be convinced of her error and by grief be forced to undergo the penalties that belong to those who are wilfully insignificant when this scurvy hour cometh upon her she first groweth angry then when the time of it is past would perhaps grow wiser not remembering that we can no more have wisdom than grace whenever we think fit to call for it there are times and periods fixed for both and when they are too long neglected the punishment is that they are irrecoverable and nothing remaineth but an useless grief for the folly of having thrown them out of our power you are to think what a mean figure a woman maketh when she is so degraded by her own fault whereas there is nothing in those duties which are expected from you that can be a lessening to you except your want of conduct makes it so you may love your children without living in the nursery and you may have a competent and discreet care of them without letting it break out upon the company or exposing yourself by turning your discourse that way which is a kind of laying children to the parish and it can hardly be done anywhere that those who hear it will be so forgiving as not to think they are overcharged with them a woman's tenderness to her children is one of the least deceitful evidences of her virtue but yet the way of expressing it must be subject to the rules of good breeding and though a woman of quality ought not to be less kind to them than mothers of the meanest rank are to theirs yet she may distinguish herself in the manner and avoid the coarse methods which in women of a lower size might be more excusable you must begin early to make them love you that they may obey you this mixture is nowhere more necessary than in children and i must tell you that you are not to expect returns of kindness from yours if ever you have any without grains of allowance and yet it is not so much a defect in their good nature as a 
shortness of thought in them their first insufficiency maketh them lean so entirely upon their parents for what is necessary that the habit of it maketh them continue the same expectations for what is unreasonable and as often as they are denied so often they think they are injured and whilst their desires are strong and their reasons yet in the cradle their anger looketh no farther than the thing they long for and cannot have and to be displeased for their own good is a maxim they are very slow to understand so that you may conclude the first thoughts of your children will have no small mixture of mutiny which being so natural you must not be angry except you would increase it you must deny them as seldom as you can and when there is no avoiding it you must do it gently you must flatter away their ill-humor and take the next opportunity of pleasing them in some other thing before they either ask or look for it this will strengthen your authority by making it soft to them and confirm their obedience by making it their interest you are to have as strict a guard upon yourself amongst your children as if you were amongst your enemies they are apt to make wrong inferences to take encouragement from half words and misapply what you may say or do so as either to lessen their duty or to extend their liberty farther than is convenient let them be more in awe of your kindness than of your power and above all take heed of supporting a favorite child in its impertinence which will give right to the rest of claiming the same privilege if you have a divided number leave the boys to the father's more peculiar care that you may with greater justice pretend to a more immediate jurisdiction over those of your own sex you are to live so with them that they may never choose to avoid you except when they have offended and then let them tremble that they may distinguish but their penance must not continue so long as to grow too sour upon their stomachs that it may not harden instead of correcting them the kind and severe part must have their several turns seasonably applied but your indulgence is to have the broader mixture that love rather than fear may be the root of their obedience your servants are in the next place to be considered and you must remember not to fall into the mistake of thinking that because they receive wages and are so much inferior to you therefore they are below your care to know how to manage them it would be as good reason for a master workman to despise the wheels of his engines because they are made of wood these are the wheels of your family and let your directions be never so faultless yet if these engines stop or move wrong the whole order of your house is either at a stand or discomposed besides the inequality which is between you must not make you forget that nature maketh no such distinction but that servants may be looked upon as humble friends and that returns of kindness and good usage are as much due to such of them as deserve it as their service is due to us when we require it a foolish haughtiness in the style of speaking or in the manner of commanding them is in itself very undecent besides that it begetteth an aversion in them of which the least ill effect to be expected is that they will be slow and careless in all that is enjoined them and you will find it true by your experience that you will be so much the more obeyed as you are less imperious be not too hasty in giving your orders nor too angry when they are not altogether observed much less are you to be loud and too much disturbed an evenness in distinguishing when they do well or ill is that which will make your family move by a rule and without noise and will the better set out your skill in conducting it with ease and silence that it may be like a well-disciplined army which knoweth how to anticipate the orders that are fit to be given them you are never to neglect the duty of the present hour to do another thing 
which though it may be better in itself is not to be unseasonably preferred a lot well chosen hours for the inspection of your family which may be so distinguished from the rest of your time that the necessary cares may come in their proper place without any influence upon your good humor or interruption to other things by these methods you will put yourself in possession of being valued by your servants and then their obedience will naturally follow i must not forget one of the greatest articles belonging to a family which is the expense it must not be such as by failing either in the time or measure of it may rather draw censure than gain applause if it was well examined there is more money given to be laughed at than for any one thing in the world though the purchasers do not think so a well-stated rule is like the line when that is once passed we are under another pole so the first straying from a rule is a step towards making that which was before a virtue to change its nature and to grow either into a vice or at least an impertinence the art of laying out money wisely is not attained to without a great deal of thought and it is yet more difficult in the case of a wife who is accountable to her husband for her mistakes in it it is not only his money his credit too is at stake if what lieth under the wife's care is managed either with indecent thrift or too loose profusion you are therefore to keep the mean between these two extremes and it being hardly possible to hold the balance exactly even let it rather incline towards the liberal side as more suitable to your quality and less subject to reproach of the two a little money misspent is sooner recovered than the credit which is lost by having it unhandsomely saved and a wise husband will less forgive a shameful piece of parsimony than a little extravagance if it be not too often repeated his mind in this must be your chief direction and his temper when once known will in great measure justify your part in the management if he is pleased with it in your clothes avoid too much gaudy do not value yourself upon an embroidered gown and remember that a reasonable word or an obliging look will gain you more respect than all your fine trappings this is not said to restrain you from a decent compliance with the world provided you take the wiser and not the foolisher part of your sex for your pattern some distinctions are to be allowed whilst they are well suited to your quality and fortune and in the distribution of the expense it seemeth to me that a full attendance and well-chosen ornaments for your house will make you a better figure than too much glittering in what you wear which may with more ease be imitated by those that are below you yet this must not tempt you to starve everything but your own apartment or in order to more abundance there give just cause to the least servant you have to complain of the want of what is necessary above all fix it in your thoughts as an unchangeable maxim that nothing is truly fine but what is fit and that just so much as is proper for your circumstances of their several kinds is much finer than all you can add to it when you once break through these bounds you launch into a wide sea of extravagance everything will become necessary because you have a mind to it and you have a mind to it not because it is fit for you but because somebody else hath it this lady's logic setteth reason upon its head by carrying the rule from things to persons and appealing from what is right to every fool that is in the wrong the word necessary is miserably applied it disordereth families and overturneth governments by being so abused remember that children and fools want everything because they want wit to distinguish and therefore there is no stronger evidence of a crazy understanding than the making too large a catalogue of things necessary 
when in truth there are so very few things that have a right to be placed in it try everything first in your judgment before you allow it a place in your desire else your husband may think it is as necessary for him to deny as it is for you to have whatever is unreasonable and if you shall too often give him that advantage the habit of refusing may perhaps reach to things that are not unfit for you there are unthinking ladies who do not enough consider how little their own figure agreeth with the fine things they are so proud of others when they have them will hardly allow them to be visible they cannot be seen without light and that is many times so saucy and so prying that like a too forward gallant it is to be forbid the chamber some when you are ushered into their dark ruelle it is with such solemnity that a man would swear there was something in it till the unskilful lady breaketh silence and beginneth a chat which discovereth it is a puppet play with magnificent scenes many esteem things rather as they are hard to be gotten than that they are worth getting this looketh as if they had an interest to pursue that maxim because a great part of their own value dependeth upon it truth in these cases would be often unmannerly and might derogate from the prerogative great ladies would assume to themselves of being distinct creatures from those of their sex which are inferior and of less difficult access in other things too your condition must give the rule to you and therefore it is not a wife's part to aim at more than a bounded liberality the farther extent of that quality otherwise to be commended belongeth to the husband who hath better means for it generosity wrong placed becometh a vice it is no more a virtue when it groweth into an inconvenience virtues must be enlarged or restrained according to differing circumstances a princely mind will undo a private family therefore things must be suited or else they will not deserve to be commended let them in themselves be never so valuable and the expectations of the world are best answered when we acquit ourselves in that manner which seemeth to be prescribed to our several conditions without usurping upon those duties which do not so particularly belong to us i will close the consideration of this article of expense with this short word do not fetter yourself with such a restraint in it as may make you remarkable but remember that virtue is the greatest ornament and good sense the best equipage end of house family and children this is section o four of the complete works of george savile first marquis of halifax this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Complete Works of George Savile, First Marquis of Halifax. Section 4. Advice to a Daughter, Behavior and Conversation. It is time now to lead you out of your house into the world, a dangerous step where your virtue alone will not secure you, except it is attended with a great deal of prudence. You must have both for your guard, and not stir without them. The enemy is abroad, and you are sure to be taken if you are found straggling. Your behavior is therefore to incline strongly towards the reserved part, your character is to be immovably fixed upon that bottom not excluding a mixture of greater freedom as far as it may be innocent and well timed the extravagancies of the age have made caution more necessary and by the same reason that the too great license of ill men hath by consequence in many things restrained the lawful liberty of those who did not abuse it the unjustifiable freedoms of some of your sex have involved the rest in the penalty of being reduced 
and though this cannot so alter the nature of things as to make that criminal which in itself is indifferent yet if it maketh it dangerous that alone is sufficient to justify the restraint a close behavior is the fittest to receive virtue for its constant guest because there and there only it can be secure proper reserves are the outworks and must never be deserted by those who intend to keep the place they keep off the possibilities not only of being taken but of being attempted and if a woman seeth danger though at never so remote a distance she is for that time to shorten her line of liberty she who will allow herself to go to the utmost extent of every thing that is lawful is so very near going farther that those who lie at watch will begin to count upon her mankind from the double temptation of vanity and desire is apt to turn everything a woman doth to the hopeful side and there are few who dare make an impudent application till they discern something which they are willing to take for an encouragement it is safer therefore to prevent such forwardness than to go about to cure it it gathereth strength by the first allowances and claimeth a right from having been at any time suffered with impunity therefore nothing is with more care to be avoided than such a kind of civility as may be mistaken for invitation and it will not be enough for you to keep yourself free from any criminal engagements for if you do that which either raiseth hopes or createth discourse there is a spot thrown upon your good name and those kind of stains are the harder to be taken out being dropped upon you by the man's vanity as well as by the woman's malice most men are in one sense platonic lovers though they are not willing to own that character they are so far philosophers as to allow that the greatest part of pleasure lieth in the mind and in pursuance of that maxim there are few who do not place the felicity more in the opinion of the world of their being prosperous lovers than in the blessing itself how much soever they appear to value it this being so you must be very cautious not to gratify these chameleons at the price of bringing a cloud upon your reputation which may be deeply wounded though your conscience is unconcerned your own sex too will not fail to help the least appearance that giveth a handle to be ill turned the best of them will not be displeased to improve their own value by laying others under a disadvantage when there is a fair occasion given for it it distinguisheth them still the more their own credit is more exalted and like a picture set off with shades shineth more when a lady either less innocent or less discreet is set near to make them appear so much the brighter if these lend their breath to blast such as are so unwary as to give them this advantage you may be sure there will be a stronger gale from those who besides malice or emulation have an interest too to strike hard upon a virtuous woman it seemeth to them that their load of infamy is lessened by throwing part of it upon others so that they will not only improve it when it lieth in their way but take pains to find out the least mistake an innocent woman committeth in revenge of the injury she doth in leading a life which is a reproach to them with these you must be extreme wary and neither provoke them to be angry nor invite them to be intimate to the men you are to have a behavior which may secure you without offending them no ill-bred affected shyness nor a roughness unsuitable to your sex and unnecessary to your virtue but a way of living that may prevent all coarse railleries or unmannerly freedoms looks that forbid without rudeness and oblige 
without invitation or leaving room for the saucy inferences men's vanity suggesteth to them upon the least encouragements this is so very nice that it must engage you to have a perpetual watch upon your eyes and to remember that one careless glance giveth more advantage than a hundred words not enough considered the language of the eyes being very much the most significant and the most observed your civility which is always to be preserved must not be carried to a compliance which may betray you into irrecoverable mistakes this french ambiguous word complaisance hath led your sex into more blame than all other things put together it carrieth them by degrees into a certain thing called a good kind of woman an easy idle creature that doth neither good nor ill but by chance hath no choice but leaveth that to the company she keepeth time which by degrees addeth to the signification of words hath made her according to the modern style little better than one who thinketh it a rudeness to deny when civilly required either her service in person or her friendly assistance to those who would have a meeting or want a confidant she is a certain thing always at hand an easy companion who hath ever great compassion for distressed lovers she censureth nothing but rigor and is never without a plaister for a wounded reputation in which chiefly lieth her skill in chirurgery she seldom hath the propriety of any particular gallant but liveth upon brokage and waiteth for the scraps her friends are content to leave her there is another character not quite so criminal yet not less ridiculous which is that of a good-humoured woman one who thinketh she must always be in a laugh or a broad smile because good humour is an obliging quality thinketh it less ill manners to talk impertinently than to be silent in company when such a prating engine rideth admiral and carrieth the lantern in a circle of fools a cheerful coxcomb coming in for a recruit the chattering of monkeys is a better noise than such a concert of senseless merriment if she is applauded in it she is so encouraged that like a ballad singer who if commended breaketh his lungs she letteth herself loose and overfloweth upon the company she conceiveth that mirth is to have no intermission and therefore she will carry it about with her though it be to a funeral and if a man should put a familiar question she doth not know very well how to be angry for then she would be no more that pretty thing called a good-humoured woman this necessity of appearing at all times to be so infinitely pleased is a grievous mistake since in a handsome woman that invitation is unnecessary and in one who is not so ridiculous it is not intended by this that you should forswear laughing but remember that fools being always painted in that posture it may fright those who are wise from doing it too frequently and going too near a copy which is so little inviting and much more from doing it loud which is an unnatural sound and looketh so much like another sex that few things are more offensive that boisterous kind of jollity is as contrary to wit and good manners as it is to modesty and virtue besides it is a coarse kind of quality that throweth a woman into a lower form and degradeth her from the rank of those who are more refined some ladies speak loud and make a noise to be the more minded which looketh as if they beat their drums for volunteers and if by misfortune none come into them they may not without reason be a good deal out of countenance there is one thing yet more to be avoided which is the example of those who intend nothing farther than the vanity of conquest and think themselves secure of not having their honour tainted by it 
some are apt to believe their virtue is too obscure and not enough known except it is exposed to a broader light and set out to its best advantage by some public trials these are dangerous experiments and generally fail being built upon so weak a foundation as that of a too great confidence in ourselves it is as safe to play with fire as to dally with gallantry love is a passion that hath friends in the garrison and for that reason must by a woman be kept at such a distance that she may not be within the danger of doing the most usual thing in the world which is conspiring against herself else the humble gallant who is only admitted as a trophy very often becometh the conqueror he putteth on the style of victory and from an admirer groweth into a master for so he may be called from the moment he is in possession the first resolutions of stopping at good opinions and esteem grow weaker by degrees against the charms of courtship skilfully applied a lady is apt to think a man speaketh so much reason whilst he is commending her that she hath much ado to believe him in the wrong when he is making love to her and when besides the natural inducements your sex hath to be merciful she is bribed by well-chosen flattery the poor creature is in danger of being caught like a bird listening to the whistle of one that hath a snare for it conquest is so tempting a thing that it often maketh women mistake men's submissions which with all their fair appearance have generally less respect than art in them you are to remember that men who say extreme fine things many times say them most for their own sakes and that the vain gallant is often as well pleased with his own compliments as he could be with the kindest answer where there is not that ostentation you are to suspect there is design and as strong perfumes are seldom used but where they are necessary to smother an unwelcome scent so excessive good words leave room to believe they are strewed to cover something which is to gain admittance under a disguise you must therefore be upon your guard and consider that of the two respect is more dangerous than anger it puts even the best understandings out of their place for the time till their second thoughts restore them it stealeth upon us insensibly throweth down our defences and maketh it too late to resist after we have given it that advantage whereas railing goeth away in sound it hath so much noise in it that by giving warning it bespeaketh caution respect is a slow and sure poison and like poison swelleth us within ourselves where it prevaileth too much it groweth to be a kind of apoplexy in the mind turneth it quite round and after it hath once seized the understanding becometh mortal to it for these reasons the safest way is to treat it like a sly enemy and to be perpetually upon the watch against it i will add one advice to conclude this head which is that you will let every seven years make some alteration in you towards the graver side and not be like the girls of fifty who resolve to be always young whatever time with his iron teeth hath determined to the contrary unnatural things carry a deformity in them never to be disguised the liveliness of youth in a riper age looketh like a new patch upon an old gown so that a gay matron a cheerful old fool may be reasonably put into the list of the tamer kind of monsters there is a certain creature called a grave hobby-horse a kind of she numps that pretendeth to be pulled to a play and must needs go to bartholomew fair to look after the young folks whom she only seemeth to make her care in reality she taketh them for her excuse 
such an old butterfly is of all creatures the most ridiculous and the soonest found out it is good to be early in your caution to avoid any thing that cometh within distance of such despicable patterns and not like some ladies who defer their conversion till they have been so long in possession of being laughed at that the world doth not know how to change their style even when they are reclaimed from that which gave the first occasion for it the advantages of being reserved are too many to set down i will only say that it is a guard to a good woman and a disguise to an ill one it is of so much use to both that those ought to use it as an artifice who refuse to practice it as a virtue End of section four Advice to a Daughter Behavior and Conversation read by John Greenman This is section five of the complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit Librivox.org. Advice to a Daughter Friendships by George Saville Read by John Greenman I must in a particular manner recommend to you a strict care in the choice of your friendships. Perhaps the best are not without their objections, but, however, be sure that yours may not stray from the rules which the wiser part of the world hath set to them the leagues of offensive and defensive seldom hold in politics and much less in friendships the violent intimacies which once broken of which they scarce ever fail make such a noise the bag of secrets untied they fly about like birds let loose from a cage and become the entertainment of the town besides these great dearnesses by degrees grow injurious to the rest of your acquaintance and throw them off from you there is such an offensive distinction when the dear friend cometh into the room that it is flinging stones at the company who are not apt to forgive it do not lay out your friendship too lavishly at first since it will like other things be so much the sooner spent neither let it be too sudden a growth for as the plants which shoot up too fast are not of that continuance as those which take more time for it so too swift a progress in pouring out your kindness is a certain sign that by the course of nature it will not be long lived you will be responsible to the world if you pitch upon such friends as at the time are under the weight of any criminal objection in that case you will bring yourself under the disadvantages of their character and must bear your part of it choosing implieth approving and if you fix upon a lady for your friend against whom the world shall have given judgment tis not so well natured as to believe you are altogether averse to her way of living since it doth not discourage you from admitting her into your kindness and resemblance of inclinations being thought none of the least inducements to friendship you will be looked upon at least as a well-wisher if not a partner with her in her faults if you can forgive them in another it may be presumed you will not be less gentle to yourself and therefore you must not take it ill if you are reckoned a croupier and condemned to pay an equal share with such a friend of the reputation she hath lost if it happeneth that your friend should fall from the state of innocence after your kindness was engaged to her you may be slow in your belief in the beginning of the discovery but as soon as you are convinced by a rational evidence you must without breaking too roughly make a far and a quick retreat from such a mistaken acquaintance else by moving too slowly from one that is so tainted the contagion may reach you so far as to give you part of the scandal though not of the guilt 
this matter is so nice that as you must not be too hasty to join in the censure upon your friend when she is accused so you are not on the other side to defend her with too much warmth for if she should happen to deserve the report of common fame besides the vexation that belongeth to such a mistake you will draw an ill appearance upon yourself and it will be thought you pleaded for her not without some consideration of yourself the anger which must be put on to vindicate the reputation of an injured friend may incline the company to suspect you would not be so zealous if there was not a possibility that the case might be your own for this reason you are not to carry your dearness so far as absolutely to lose your sight where your friend is concerned because malice is too quick-sighted it doth not follow that friendships must be blind there is to be a mean between these two extremes else your excess of good nature may betray you into a very ridiculous figure and by degrees who may be preferred to such offices as you will not be proud of your ignorance may lessen the guilt but will improve the jest upon you who shall be kindly solicitous to procure a meeting and innocently contribute to the ills you would avoid whilst the contriving lovers when they are alone shall make you the subject of their mirth and perhaps with respect to the goddess of love be it spoken it is not the worst part of their entertainment at least it is the most lasting to laugh at the believing friend who was so easily deluded let the good sense of your friends be a chief ingredient in your choice of them else let your reputation be never so clear it may be clouded by their impertinence it is like our houses being in the power of a drunken or a careless neighbor only so much worse as that there will be no insurance here to make you amends as there is in the case of fire to conclude this paragraph if formality is to be allowed in any instance it is to be put on to resist the invasion of such forward women as shall press themselves into your friendship where if admitted they will either be a snare or an encumbrance end of advice to a daughter friendships This is section 6 of the complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Advice to a Daughter. Censure. Read by John Greenman. I will come next to the consideration how you are to manage your censure, in which both care and skill will be a good deal required to distinguish is not only natural but necessary and the effect of it is that we cannot avoid giving judgment in our minds either to absolve or to condemn as the case requireth the difficulty is to know when and where it is fit to proclaim the sentence an aversion to what is criminal a contempt of what is ridiculous are the inseparable companions of understanding and virtue but the letting them go farther than our own thoughts hath so much danger in it that though it is neither possible nor fit to suppress them entirely yet it is necessary they should be kept under very great restraints An unlimited liberty of this kind is little less than sending a herald and proclaiming war to the world which is an angry beast when so provoked the contest will be unequal though you are never so much in the right and if you begin against such an adversary it will tear you in pieces with this justification that it is done in its own defence you must therefore take heed of laughing except in company that is very sure it is throwing snowballs against bullets and it is the disadvantage of a woman 
that the malice of the world will help the brutality of those who will throw a slovenly untruth upon her you are for this reason to suppress your impatience for fools who besides that they are too strong a party to be unnecessarily provoked are of all others the most dangerous in this case a blockhead in his rage will return a dull jest that will lie heavy though there is not a grain of wit in it others will do it with more art and you must not think yourself secure because your reputation may perhaps be out of the reach of ill-will for if it findeth that part guarded it will seek one which is more exposed it flieth like a corrupt humor in the body to the weakest part if you have a tender side the world will be sure to find it and to put the worst color upon all you say or do give an aggravation to everything that may lessen you and a spiteful turn to everything that might recommend you anger layeth open those defects which friendship would not see and civility might be willing to forget malice needeth no such invitation to encourage it neither are any pains more superfluous than those we take to be ill spoken of if envy which never dieth and seldom sleepeth is content sometimes to be in a slumber it is very unskilful to make a noise to awake it besides your wit will be misapplied if it is wholly directed to discern the faults of others when it is so necessary to be often used to mend and prevent your own the sending our thoughts too much abroad hath the same effect as when a family never stayeth at home neglect and disorder naturally followeth as it must do within ourselves if we do not frequently turn our eyes inward to see what is amiss with us where it is a sign we have an unwelcome prospect when we do not care to look upon it but rather seek our consolations in the faults of those we converse with avoid being the first in fixing a hard censure let it be confirmed by the general voice before you give in to it neither are you then to give sentence like a magistrate or as if you had a special authority to bestow a good or ill name at your discretion do not dwell too long upon a weak side touch and go away take pleasure to stay longer where you can commend like bees that fix only upon those herbs out of which they may extract the juice of which their honey is composed a virtue stuck with bristles is too rough for this age it must be adorned with some flowery or else it will be unwillingly entertained so that even where it may be fit to strike do it like a lady gently and assure yourself that where you care to do it you will wound others more and hurt yourself less by soft strokes than by being harsh or violent the triumph of wit is to make your good nature subdue your censure to be quick in seeing faults and slow in exposing them you are to consider that the invisible thing called a good name is made up of the breath of numbers that speak well of you so that if by a disobliging word you silence the meanest the gale will be less strong which is to bear up your esteem and though nothing is so vain as the eager pursuit of empty applause yet to be well thought of and to be kindly used by the world is like a glory about a woman's head tis a perfume she carrieth about with her and leaveth wherever she goeth tis a charm against ill-will malice may empty her quiver but cannot wound the dirt will not stick the jests will not take without the consent of the world a scandal doth not go deep it is only a slight stroke upon the injured party and returneth with the greater force upon those that gave it end of advice to a daughter censure read by john greenman
This is section seven of The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax, Advice to a Daughter, Vanity and Affectation. Read by John Greenman. I must with more than ordinary earnestness give you caution against vanity it being the fault to which your sex seemeth to be the most inclined and since affectation for the most part attendeth it i do not know how to divide them i will not call them twins because more properly vanity is the mother and affectation is the darling daughter vanity is the sin and affectation is the punishment the first may be called the root of self-love, the other the fruit. Vanity is never at its full growth till it spreadeth into affectation, and then it is complete. Not to dwell any longer upon the definition of them, I will pass to the means and motives to avoid them. In order to it you are to consider that the world challengeth the right of distributing esteem and applause so that where any assume by their single authority to be their own carvers it groweth angry and never faileth to seek revenge and if we may measure a fault by the greatness of the penalty there are few of a higher size than vanity as there is scarce a punishment which can be heavier than that of being laughed at vanity maketh a woman tainted with it so top full of herself that she spilleth it upon the company and because her own thoughts are entirely employed in self-contemplation she endeavoureth by a cruel mistake to confine her acquaintance to the same narrow circle of that which only concerneth her ladyship forgetting that she is not of half that importance to the world that she is to herself so mistaken she is in her value by being her own appraiser she will fetch such a compass in discourse to bring in her beloved self and rather than fail her fine petticoat that there can hardly be a better scene than such a trial of ridiculous ingenuity it is a pleasure to see her angle for commendations and rise so dissatisfied with the ill-bred company if they will not bite to observe her throwing her eyes about to fetch in prisoners and go about cruising like a privateer and so out of countenance if she return without booty is no ill piece of comedy she is so eager to draw respect that she always misseth it yet thinketh it so much her due that when she faileth she groweth waspish not considering that it is impossible to commit a rape upon the will that it must be fairly gained and will not be taken by storm and that in this case the tax ever riseth highest by a benevolence if the world instead of admiring her imaginary excellencies taketh the liberty to laugh at them she appealeth from it to herself for whom she giveth sentence and proclaimeth it in all companies on the other side if encouraged by a civil word she is so obliging that she will give thanks for being laughed at in good language she taketh a compliment for a demonstration and setteth it up as an evidence even against her looking-glass but the good lady being all this while in a most profound ignorance of herself forgetteth that men would not let her talk upon them and throw so many senseless words at their head if they did not intend to put her person to fine and ransom for her impertinence good words of any other lady are so many stones thrown at her she can by no means bear them they make her so uneasy that she cannot keep her seat but up she riseth and goeth home half burst with anger and straight-lacing if by great chance she saith anything that hath sense in it 
she expecteth such an excessive rate of commendations that to her thinking the company ever riseth in her debt she looketh upon rules as things made for the common people and not for persons of her rank and this opinion sometimes tempteth her to extend her prerogative to the dispensing with the commandments if by great fortune she happeneth in spite of her vanity to be honest she is so troublesome with it that as far as in her lieth she maketh a scurvy thing of it her bragging of her virtue looketh as if it cost her so much pains to get the better of herself that the inferences are very ridiculous her good humor is generally applied to the laughing at good sense it would do one good to see how heartily she despiseth anything that is fit for her to do the greatest part of her fancy is laid out in choosing her gown as her discretion is chiefly employed in not paying for it she is faithful to the fashion to which not only her opinion but her senses are wholly resigned so obsequious she is to it that she would be ready to be reconciled even to virtue with all its faults if she had her dancing master's word that it was practised at court to a woman so composed when affectation cometh in to improve her character it is then raised to the highest perfection she first setteth up for a fine thing and for that reason will distinguish herself right or wrong in everything she doth she would have it thought that she is made of so much the finer clay and so much more sifted than ordinary that she hath no common earth about her to this end she must neither move nor speak like other women because it would be vulgar and therefore must have a language of her own since ordinary english is too coarse for her the looking-glass in the morning dictateth to her all the motions of the day which by how much the more studied are so much the more mistaken she cometh into a room as if her limbs were set on with ill-made screws which maketh the company fear the pretty thing should leave some of its artificial person upon the floor she doth not like herself as god almighty made her but will have some of her own workmanship which is so far from making her a better thing than a woman that it turneth her into a worse creature than a monkey she falleth out with nature against which she maketh war without admitting a truce those moments excepted in which her gallant may reconcile her to it when she hath a mind to be soft and languishing there is something so unnatural in that affected easiness that her frowns could not be by many degrees so forbidden when she would appear unreasonably humble one may see she is so excessively proud that there is no enduring it there is such an impertinent smile such a satisfied simper when she faintly disowneth some fulsome commendation a man happeneth to bestow upon her against his conscience that her thanks for it are more visible under such a thin disguise than they could be if she should print them if a handsomer woman taketh any liberty of dressing out of the ordinary rules the mistaken lady followeth without distinguishing the unequal pattern and maketh herself uglier by an example misplaced either forgetting the privilege of good looks in another or presuming without sufficient reason upon her own her discourse is a senseless chime of empty words a heap of compliments so equally applied to differing persons that they are neither valued nor believed her eyes keep pace with her tongue and are therefore always in motion one may discern that they generally incline to the compassionate side and that notwithstanding her pretense to virtue she is gentle to distressed lovers and ladies that are merciful she will repeat the tender part of a play so feelingly that the company may guess without injustice she was not altogether a disinterested spectator she thinketh that paint and sin are concealed by railing at them 
upon the latter she is less hard and being divided between the two opposite prides of her beauty and her virtue she is often tempted to give broad hints that somebody is dying for her and of the two she is less unwilling to let the world think she may be sometimes profaned than that she is never worshipped very great beauty may perhaps so dazzle for a time that men may not so clearly see the deformity of these affectations but when the brightness goeth off and that the lover's eyes are by that means set at liberty to see things as they are he will naturally return to his senses and recover the mistake into which the lady's good looks had at first engaged him and being once undeceived ceaseth to worship that as a goddess which he seeth is only an artificial shrine moved by wheels and springs to delude him such women please only like the first opening of a scene that hath nothing to recommend it but the being new they may be compared to flies that have pretty shining wings for two or three hot months but the first cold weather maketh an end of them so the latter season of these fluttering creatures is dismal from their nearest friends they receive a very faint respect from the rest of the world the utmost degree of contempt let this picture supply the place of any other rules which might be given to prevent your resemblance to it the deformity of it well considered is instruction enough from the same reason that the sight of a drunkard is a better sermon against that vice than the best that was ever preached upon that subject End of Advice to a Daughter, Vanity and Affectation Read by John Greenman This is Section 8 of The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax, Advice to a Daughter, Pride read by john greenman after having said this against vanity i do not intend to apply the same censure to pride well placed and rightly defined it is an ambiguous word one kind of it is as much a virtue as the other is a vice but we are naturally so apt to choose the worst that it is become dangerous to commend the best side of it a woman is not to be proud of her fine gown nor when she hath less wit than her neighbors to comfort herself that she hath more lace some ladies put so much weight upon ornaments that if one could see into their hearts it would be found that even the thought of death is made less heavy to them by the contemplation of their being laid out in state and honorably attended to the grave one may come a good deal short of such an extreme and yet still be sufficiently impertinent by setting a wrong value upon things which ought to be used with more indifference a lady must not appear solicitous to engross respect to herself but be content with a reasonable distribution and allow it to others that she may have it returned to her she is not to be troublesomely nice nor distinguish herself by being too delicate as if ordinary things were too coarse for her this is an unmannerly and offensive pride and when it is practised deserveth to be mortified of which it seldom faileth she is not to lean too much upon her quality much less to despise those who are below it some make quality an idol and then their reason must fall down and worship it they would have the world think that no amends can ever be made for the want of a great title or an ancient coat of arms 
they imagine that with these advantages they stand upon the higher ground which maketh them look down upon merit and virtue as things inferior to them this mistake is not only senseless but criminal too in putting a greater price upon that which is a piece of good luck than upon things which are valuable in themselves laughing is not enough for such a folly it must be severely whipped as it justly deserves it will be confessed there are frequent temptations given by pert upstarts to be angry and by that to have our judgments corrupted in these cases but they are to be resisted and the utmost that is to be allowed is when those of a new edition will forget themselves so as either to brag of their weak side or to endeavor to hide their meanness by their insolence to cure them by a little seasonable raillery a little sharpness well placed without dwelling too long upon it these and many other kinds of pride are to be avoided that which is to be recommended to you is the emulation to raise yourself to a character by which you may be distinguished an eagerness for precedence in virtue and all such other things as may gain you a greater share of the good opinion of the world esteem to virtue is like a cherishing air to plants and flowers which maketh them blow and prosper and for that reason it may be allowed to be in some degree the cause as well as the reward of it that pride which leadeth to a good end cannot be a vice since it is the beginning of a virtue and to be pleased with just applause is so far from a fault that it would be an ill symptom in a woman who should not place the greatest part of her satisfaction in it humility is no doubt a great virtue but it ceaseth to be so when it is afraid to scorn an ill thing against vice and folly it is becoming your sex to be haughty but you must not carry the contempt of things to arrogance towards persons and it must be done with fitting distinctions else it may be inconvenient by being unseasonable a pride that raiseth a little anger to be outdone in any thing that is good will have so good an effect that it is very hard to allow it to be a fault it is no easy matter to carry even between these differing kinds so described but remember that it is safer for a woman to be thought too proud than too familiar end of advice to a daughter pride read by john greenman This is section 9 of The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquess of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquess of Halifax. Advice to a Daughter. Diversions. The last thing I shall recommend to you is a wise and a safe method of using diversions. To be too eager in the pursuit of pleasure whilst you are young is dangerous to catch at it in riper years is grasping a shadow it will not be held besides that by being less natural it groweth to be indecent diversions are the most properly applied to ease and relieve those who are oppressed by being too much employed those that are idle have no need of them and yet they above all others give themselves up to them to unbend our thoughts when they are too much stretched by our cares is not more natural than it is necessary but to turn our whole life into a holy day is not only ridiculous but destroyeth pleasure instead of promoting it the mind like the body is tired by being always in one posture too serious breaketh and too diverting looseneth it it is variety that giveth the relish 
so that diversions too frequently repeated grow first to be indifferent and at last tedious whilst they are well chosen and well timed they are never to be blamed but when they are used to an excess though very innocent at first they often grow to be criminal and never fail to be impertinent some ladies are bespoken for merry meetings as bezath was for duels they are engaged in a circle of idleness where they turn round for the whole year without the interruption of a serious hour they know all the players names and are intimately acquainted with all the booths in bartholomew fair no soldier is more obedient to the sound of his captain's trumpet than they are to that which summoneth them to a puppet play or a monster the spring that bringeth out flies and fools maketh them inhabitants in hyde park in the winter they are in encumbrance to the playhouse and the ballast of the drawing-room the streets all this while are so weary of these daily faces that men's eyes are overlaid with them the sight is glutted with fine things as the stomach with sweet ones and when a fair lady will give too much of herself to the world she groweth luscious and oppresseth instead of pleasing these jolly ladies do so continually seek diversion that in a little time they grow into a jest yet are unwilling to remember that if they were seldomer seen they would not be so often laughed at besides they make themselves cheap than which there cannot be an unkinder word bestowed upon your sex to play sometimes to entertain company or to divert yourself is not to be disallowed but to do it so often as to be called a gamester is to be avoided next to the things that are most criminal it hath consequences of several kinds not to be endured it will engage you into a habit of idleness and ill hours draw you into ill-mixed company make you neglect your civilities abroad and your business at home and impose into your acquaintance such as will do you no credit to deep play there will be yet greater objections it will give occasion to the world to ask spiteful questions how you dare venture to lose and what means you have to pay such great sums if you pay exactly it will be inquired from whence the money cometh if you owe and especially to a man you must be so very civil to him for his forbearance that it layeth the ground of having it farther improved if the gentleman is so disposed who will be thought no unfair creditor if were the state faileth he seizeth upon the person besides if a lady could see her own face upon an ill game at a deep stake she would certainly forswear anything that could put her looks under such a disadvantage to dance sometimes will not be imputed to you as a fault but remember that the end of your learning it was that you might the better know how to move gracefully it is only an advantage so far when it goeth beyond it one may call it excelling in a mistake which is no very great commendation it is better for a woman never to dance because she hath no skill in it than to do it too often because she doth it well the easiest as well as the safest method of doing it is in private companies amongst particular friends and then carelessly like a diversion rather than with solemnity as if it was a business or had anything in it to deserve a month's preparation by serious conference with a dancing master much more might be said to all these heads and many more might be added to them but i must restrain my thoughts which are full of my dear child and would overflow into a volume which would not be fit for a new year's gift i will conclude with my warmest wishes for all that is good to you that you may live so as to be an ornament to your family and a pattern to your sex that you may be blessed 
with a husband that may value, and with children that may inherit your virtue, that you may shine in the world by a true light, and silence envy by deserving to be esteemed, that wit and virtue may both conspire to make you a great figure. When they are separated, the first is so empty and the other so faint that they scarce have right to be commended. May they therefore meet and never part. Let them be your guardian angels, and be sure never to stray out of the distance of their joint protection. May you so raise your character that you may help to make the next age a better thing, and leave posterity in your debt for the disadvantage it shall receive by your example. Let me conjure you, my dearest, to comply with this kind ambition of a father, whose thoughts are so engaged in your behalf that he reckoneth your happiness to be the greatest part of his own. End of Diversions and End of Advice to a Daughter Read by John Greenman This is section 10 of the Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax, Section 10, The Character of a Trimmer, The Preface, read by John Greenman. It must be more than ordinary provocation that can tempt a man to write in an age overrun with scribners, as Egypt was with flies and locusts. That worst vermin of small authors hath given the world such a surfeit, that instead of desiring to write, a man would be more inclined to wish, for his own ease, that he could not read. But there are some things which do so raise our passions, that our reason can make no resistance. And when madmen, in two extremes, shall agree to make common sense treason, and join to fix an ill character upon the only men in the nation who deserve a good one, I am no longer master of my better resolution to let the world alone, and must break loose from my more reasonable thoughts to expose these false coiners, who would make their copper wares pass upon us for good payment. Amongst all the engines of dissension, there hath been none more powerful in all times than the fixing names upon one another of contumely and reproach, and the reason is plain, in respect of the people, who, though generally they are incapable of making a syllogism, or forming an argument, yet they can pronounce a word, and that serveth their turn to throw it with their dull malice at the head of those they do not like. Such things ever begin in jest, and end in blood, and the same word which at first maketh the company merry, groweth in time to a military signal to cut one another's throats. These mistakes are to be lamented, though not easily cured, being suitable enough to the corrupted nature of mankind. But tis hard that men will not only invent ill names, but they will rest and misinterpret good ones. So afraid some are even of a reconciling sound, that they raise another noise to keep it from being heard lest it should set up and encourage a dangerous sort of men who prefer peace and agreement before violence and confusion. Were it not for this, why, after we have played the fool with throwing Whig and Tory at one another, as boys do snowballs, do we grow angry at a new name, which by its true signification might do as much to put us into our wits as the other hath done to put us out of them. This innocent word trimmer signifieth no more than this, that if men are together in a boat, and one part of the company would weigh it down on one side, another would make it lean as much to the contrary. It happeneth there is a third opinion of those who conceive it could do as well if the boat went even 
without endangering the passengers now tis hard to imagine by what figure in language or by what rule in sense this cometh to be a fault and it is much more a wonder it should be thought a heresy but so it happeneth that the poor trimmer hath now all the powder spent upon him alone while the wig is a forgotten or at least a neglected enemy there is no danger now to the state if some men may be believed but from the beast called a trimmer take heed of him he is the instrument that must destroy church and state a strange kind of monster whose deformity is so exposed that were it a true picture that is made of him it would be enough to fright children and make women miscarry at the sight of it but it may be worth examining whether he is such a beast as he is painted i am not of that opinion and am so far from thinking him an infidel either in church or state that i am neither afraid to expose the articles of his faith in relation to government nor to say that i prefer them before any other political creed that either our angry divines or our refined statesmen would impose upon us i have therefore in the following discourse endeavored to explain the trimmer's principles and opinions and then leave it to all discerning and impartial judges whether he can with justice be so arraigned and whether those who deliberately pervert a good name do not very justly deserve the worst that can be put upon themselves End of the character of a trimmer the preface read by john greenman this is section eleven of the complete works of george saville first marquis of halifax this librivox recording is in the public domain the complete works of george saville first marquis of halifax the trimmer's opinion of the laws and government read by john greenman our trimmer as he hath a great veneration for laws in general so he hath a more particular for our own he looketh upon them as the chains that tie up our unruly passions which else like wild beasts let loose would reduce the world into its first state of barbarism and hostility the good things we enjoy we owe to them and all the ill things we are freed from is by their protection god himself thought it not enough to be a creator without being a lawgiver and his goodness had been defective towards mankind in making them if he had not prescribed rules to make them happy to all laws flow from that of nature and where that is not the foundation they may be legally imposed but they will be lamely obeyed by this nature is not meant that which fools and madmen misquote to justify their excesses it is innocent and uncorrupted nature that which disposeth men to choose virtue without its being prescribed and which is so far from inspiring ill thoughts into us that we take pains to suppress the good ones it infuseth the civilized world hath ever paid a willing subjection to laws even conquerors have done homage to them as the romans who took patterns of good laws even from those they had subdued and at the same time that they triumphed over an enslaved people the very laws of that place did not only remain safe but became victorious their new masters instead of suppressing them paid them more respect than they had from those who first made them and by this wise method they arrived to such an admirable constitution of laws that to this day they reign by them this excellency of them triumpheth still and the world payeth now an acknowledgment of their obedience to that mighty empire though so many ages after it is dissolved and by a later instance the kings of france who in practice use their laws pretty familiarly 
yet think their picture is drawn with most advantage upon their seals when they are placed in the seat of justice and though the hieroglyphic is not there of so much use to the people as they would wish yet it showeth that no prince is so great as not to think fit for his own credit at least to give an outward when he refuseth a real worship to the laws they are to mankind that which the sun is to plants whilst it cherisheth and preserveth them where they have their force and are not clouded or suppressed every thing smileth and flourisheth but where they are darkened and not suffered to shine out it maketh everything to wither and decay they secure men not only against one another but against themselves too they are a sanctuary to which the crown hath occasion to resort as often as the people so that it is an interest as well as a duty to preserve them there would be no end of making a panegyric of laws let it be enough to add that without laws the world would become a wilderness and men little less than beasts but with all this the best things may come to be the worst if they are not in good hands and if it be true that the wisest men generally make the laws it is as true that the strongest do often interpret them and as rivers belong as much to the channel where they run as to the spring from whence they first rise so the laws depend as much upon the pipes through which they are to pass as upon the fountain from whence they flow the authority of a king who is head of the law as well as the dignity of public justice is debased when the clear stream of the law is puddled and disturbed by bunglers or conveyed by unclean instruments to the people our trimmer would have them appear in their full luster and would be grieved to see the day when instead of speaking with authority from the seats of justice they should speak out of a grate, with a lamenting voice like prisoners that desire to be rescued he wisheth that the bench may have a natural as well as a legal superiority to the bar he thinketh men's abilities very much misplaced when the reason of him that pleadeth is visibly too strong for those who judge and give sentence when those from the bar seem to dictate to their superiors upon the bench their furs will look scurvily about them and the respect of the world will leave the bare character of a judge to follow the essential knowledge of a lawyer who may be greater in himself than the other can be with all his trappings an uncontested superiority in any calling will have the better of any discountenance that authority can put upon it and therefore if ever such an unnatural method should be introduced it is then that westminster hall might be said to stand upon its head and though justice itself can never be so yet the administration of it would be rendered ridiculous a judge hath such power lodged in him that the king will never be thought to have chosen well where the voice of mankind hath not beforehand recommended the man to his station when men are made judges of what they do not understand the world censureth such a choice not out of ill-will to the men but fear to themselves if the king had the sole power of choosing physicians men would tremble to see bunglers preferred yet the necessity of taking physic from a doctor is generally not so great as that of receiving justice from a judge and yet the inferences will be very severe in such cases for either it will be thought that such men bought what they were not able to deserve or which is as bad that obedience shall be looked upon as a better qualification in a judge than skill or integrity when such sacred things as the laws are not only touched but guided by profane hands men will fear that out of the tree of the law from whence we expect shade and shelter such workmen will make cudgels to beat us with or rather they will turn to the cannon upon our properties 
that were entrusted with them for their defense. To see the laws mangled, disguised, speak quite another language than their own, to see them thrown from the dignity of protecting mankind to the disgraceful office of destroying them, and notwithstanding their innocence in themselves to be made the worst instruments that the most refined villainy can make use of, will raise men's anger above the power of laying it down again, and tempt them to follow the evil examples given them of judging without hearing, when so provoked by their desire of revenge. Our trimmer, therefore, as he thinketh the laws are jewels, so he believeth that they are nowhere better set than in the constitution of our English government, if rightly understood, and carefully preserved. It would be too great partiality to say they are perfect or liable to no objection. Such things are not of this world. But if they have more excellencies and fewer faults than any other we know, it is enough to recommend them to our esteem. The dispute, which is a greater beauty, a monarchy or a commonwealth, hath lasted long between their contending lovers, and they have behaved themselves so like lovers, who in good manners must be out of their wits, who used such figures to exalt their own idols on either side, and such angry aggravations to reproach one another in the contest, that moderate men have in all times smiled upon this eagerness, and thought it differed very little from a downright frenzy. We in England, by a happy use of the controversy, conclude them both in the wrong, and reject them from being our pattern, not taking the words in the utmost extent, which is monarchy, a thing that leaveth men no liberty, and a commonwealth, such a one as alloweth them no quiet. We think that a wise mean between these barbarous extremes is that which self-preservation ought to dictate to our wishes. And we may say we have attained to this mean in a greater measure than any nation now in being, or perhaps any we have read of, though never so much celebrated for the wisdom or felicity of their constitutions. We take from one the too great power of doing hurt, and yet leave enough to govern and protect us. We take from the other the confusion, the parity, the animosities, and the license, and yet reserve a due care of such a liberty as may consist with men's allegiance. But it being hard, if not impossible, to be exactly even, our government hath much the stronger bias towards monarchy, which by the general consent and practice of mankind seemeth to have the advantage in dispute against a commonwealth. The rules of a commonwealth are too hard for the bulk of mankind to come up to. That form of government requireth such a spirit to carry it on, as doth not dwell in great numbers, but is restrained to so very few, especially in this age, that let the methods appear never so reasonable in paper, they must fail in practice, which will ever be suited more to men's nature as it is, than as it should be. Monarchy is liked by the people for the bells and the tinsel, the outward pomp and gilding, and there must be milk for babes, since the greatest part of mankind are, and ever will be, included in that list. And it is approved by wise and thinking men, all circumstances and objections impartially considered, that it hath so great an advantage above all other forms, when the administration of that power falleth in good hands, that all other governments look out of countenance, when they are set in competition with it. Lycurgus might have saved himself the trouble of making laws if either he had been immortal, or that he could have secured to posterity a succeeding race of princes like himself. His own example was a better law than he could with all his skill tell how to make. Such a prince is a living law that dictateth to his subjects 
whose thoughts in that case never rise above their obedience the confidence they have in the virtue and knowledge of the master preventing the scruples and apprehensions to which men are naturally inclined in relation to those that govern them such a magistrate is the life and soul of justice whereas the law is but a body and a dead one too without his influence to give it warmth and vigor and by the irresistible power of his virtue he doth so reconcile dominion and allegiance that all disputes between them are silenced and subdued and indeed no monarchy can be perfect and absolute without exception but where the prince is superior by his virtue as well as by his character and his power so that to screw out precedents of unlimited power is a plain diminution to a prince that nature hath made great and who had better make himself a glorious example to posterity than borrow an authority from dark records raised out of the grave which besides their non-usage have always in them matter of controversy and debate and it may be affirmed that the instances are very rare of princes having the worst in the dispute with their people if they were eminent for justice in time of peace or conduct in time of war such advantage the crown giveth to those who adorn it by their own personal virtues but since for the greater honor of good and wise princes and the better to set off their character by the comparison heaven hath decreed there must be a mixture and that such as are perverse or insufficient or perhaps both are at least to have their equal turns in the government of the world and besides that the will of man is so various and so unbounded a thing and so fatal too when joined with power misapplied it is no wonder if those who are to be governed are unwilling to have so dangerous as well as so uncertain a standard of their obedience there must be therefore rules and laws for want of which or at least the observation of them it was as capital for man to say that nero did not play well upon the lute as to commit treason or blaspheme the gods and even vespasian himself had like to have lost his life for sleeping whilst he should have attended and admired that empress impertinence upon the stage there is a wantonness in great power that men are generally too apt to be corrupted with and for that reason a wise prince to prevent the temptation arising from common frailty would choose to govern by rules for his own sake as well as for his people's since it only secureth him from errors and doth not lessen the real authority that a good magistrate would care to be possessed of for if the will of a prince is contrary either to reason itself or to the universal opinion of his subjects the law by a kind of restraint rescueth him from a disease that would undo him if his will on the other side is reasonable or well directed that will immediately becometh a law and he is arbitrary by an easy and natural consequence without taking pains or overturning the world for it if princes consider laws as things imposed on them they have the appearance of fetters of iron but to such as would make them their choice as well as their practice they are chains of gold and in that respect are ornaments as in others they are a defence to them and by a comparison not improper for god's vicegerents upon earth as our maker never commandeth our obedience to anything that as reasonable creatures we ought not to make our own election so a good and wise governor though all laws were abolished would by the voluntary direction of his own reason do without restraint the very same things that they would have enjoined our trimmer thinketh that the king and kingdom ought to be one creature not to be separated in their political capacity and when either of them undertake to act a part it is like the crawling of worms after they are cut in pieces which cannot be a lasting motion the whole creature not stirring at a time 
if the body have a dead palsy the head cannot make it move and god hath not yet delegated such a healing power to princes as that they can in a moment say to a languishing people oppressed and in despair take up your beds and walk the figure of a king is so comprehensive and exalted a thing that it is a kind of degrading him to lodge that power separately in his own natural person which can never be safely or naturally great but where the people are so united to him as to be flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone for when he is reduced to the single definition of a man he sinketh into so low a character that it is a temptation upon men's allegiance and an impairing that veneration which is necessary to preserve their duty to him whereas a prince who is so joined to his people that they seem to be his limbs rather than his subjects clothed with mercy and justice rightly applied in their several places his throne supported by love as well as by power and the warm wishes of his devoted subjects like never failing incense still ascending towards him looketh so like the best image we can frame to ourselves of god almighty that men would have much ado not to fall down and worship him and would be much more tempted to the sin of idolatry than to that of disobedience our trimmer is of opinion that there must be so much dignity inseparably annexed to the royal function as may be sufficient to secure it from insolence and contempt and there must be condescensions from the throne like kind showers from heaven that the prince may look so much the more like god almighty's deputy upon earth for power without love hath a terrifying aspect and the worship which is paid to it is like that which the indians give out of fear to wild beasts and devils he that feareth god only because there is an hell must wish there were no god and he who feareth the king only because he can punish must wish there were no king so that without a principle of love there can be no true allegiance and there must remain perpetual seeds of resistance against a power that is built upon such an unnatural foundation as that of fear and terror all force is a kind of foul play and whosoever aimeth at it himself doth by implication allow it to those he playeth with so that there will be ever matter prepared in the minds of people when they are provoked and the prince to secure himself must live in the midst of his own subjects as if he were in a conquered country raise arms as if he were immediately to meet or resist an invasion and all this while sleep as unquietly from the fear of the remedies as he did before from that of the disease it being hard for him to forget that more princes have been destroyed by their guards than by their people and that even at the time when the rule was quod principi placuit lex esto the armies and the praetorian bands which were the instruments of that unruly power were frequently the means made use of to destroy them who had it there will ever be this difference between god and his vicegerents that god is still above the instruments he useth and out of the danger of receiving hurt from them but princes can never lodge power in any hands which may not at some time turn it back upon them for though it is possible enough for a king to have power to satisfy his ambition yet no kingdom hath money enough to satisfy the avarice of under workmen who learn from that prince who will exact more than belongeth to him to expect from him much more than they deserve and growing angry upon the first disappointment they are the devils which grow terrible to the conjurers themselves who brought them up and can't send them down again and besides that there can be no lasting radical security but when the governed are satisfied with the governors it must be a dominion very unpleasant to a prince of an elevated mind to impose an abject and sordid servility instead of receiving the willing sacrifice of duty and obedience 
the bravest princes in all times who were uncapable of any other kind of fear have feared to grieve their own people such a fear is a glory and in this sense tis an infamy not to be a coward so that the mistaken heroes who are void of this generous kind of fear need no other aggravation to complete their ill characters when a despotic prince hath bruised all his subjects with a slavish obedience all the force he can use cannot subdue his own fears enemies of his own creation to which he can never be reconciled it being impossible to do injustice and not to fear revenge there is no cure for this fear but the not deserving to be hurt and therefore a prince who doth not allow his thoughts to stray beyond the rules of justice hath always the blessing of an inward quiet and assurance as a natural effect of his good meaning to his people and though he will not neglect due precautions to secure himself in all events yet he is uncapable of entertaining vain and remote suspicions of those of whom he resolveth never to deserve ill it is very hard for a prince to fear rebellion who neither doth nor intendeth to do anything to provoke it therefore too great a diligence in the governors to raise and improve dangers and fears from the people is no very good symptom and naturally begetteth an inference that they have thoughts of putting their subjects allegiance to a trial and therefore not without some reason fear beforehand that the irregularities they intend may raise men to a resistance our trimmer thinketh it no advantage to a government to endeavour the suppressing all kind of right which may remain in the body of the people or to employ small authors in it whose officiousness or want of money may encourage them to write though it is not very easy to have abilities equal to such a subject they forget that in their too high strained arguments for the rights of princes they very often plead against humane nature which will always give a bias to those reasons which seem of her side it is the people that readeth those books and it is the people that must judge of them and therefore no maxims should be laid down for the right of government to which there can be any reasonable objection for the world hath an interest and for that reason is more than ordinary discerning to find out the weak sides of such arguments as are intended to do them hurt and it is a diminution to a government to promote or countenance such well-affected mistakes which are turned upon it with disadvantage whenever they are detected and exposed and naturally the too earnest endeavors to take from men the right they have tempt them by the example to claim that which they have not in power as in most other things the way for princes to keep it is not to grasp more than their arms can well hold the nice and unnecessary inquiring into these things or the licensing some books and suppressing some others without sufficient reason to justify the doing either is so far from being an advantage to a government that it exposes it to the censure of being partial and to the suspicion of having some hidden designs to be carried on by these unusual methods when all is said there is a natural reason of state an undefinable thing grounded upon the common good of mankind which is immortal and in all changes and revolutions still preserveth its original right of saving a nation when the letter of the law perhaps would destroy it and by whatsoever means it moveth carrieth a power with it that admitteth of no opposition being supported by nature which inspireth an immediate consent at some critical times into every individual member to that which visibly tendeth to preservation of the whole and this being so a wise prince instead of controverting the right of this reason of state will by all means endeavour it may be of his side and then he will be secure 
our trimmer cannot conceive that the power of any prince can be lasting but where tis built upon the foundation of his own unborrowed virtue he must not only be the first mover and the fountain from whence the great acts of state originally flow but he must be thought so to his people that they may preserve their veneration for him he must be jealous of his power and not impart so much of it to any about him as that he may suffer an eclipse by it he cannot take too much care to keep himself up for when a prince is thought to be led by those with whom he should onely advise and that the commands he giveth are transmitted through him and are not of his own growth the world will look upon him as a bird adorned with feathers that are not his own or consider him rather as an engine than a living creature besides twould be a contradiction for a prince to fear a commonwealth and at the same time create one himself by delegating such a power to any number of men near him as is inconsistent with the figure of a monarch it is the worst kind of coordination the crown can submit to for it is the exercise of power that draweth the respect along with it and when that is parted with the bare character of a king is not sufficient to keep it up but though it is a diminution to a prince to parcel out so literally his power amongst his favorites it is worse to divide with any other man and to bring himself in competition with a single rival a partner in government is so unnatural a thing that it is a squinty-eyed allegiance that must be paid to such a double-bottom monarchy the two czars of muscovy are an example that the more civilized part of the world will not be prone to follow whatsoever gloss may be put upon this method by those to whom it may be of some use the prince will do well to remember and reflect upon the story of certain men who had set up a statue in honor of the sun yet in a very little time they turned their backs to the sun and their faces to the statue these mystical unions are better placed in the other world than they are in this and we shall have much ado to find that in a monarch god's vicegerency is delegated to more heads than that which is anointed princes may lend some of their light to make another shine but they must still preserve the superiority of being the brighter planet and when it happeneth that the reversion is in men's eyes there is more care necessary to keep up the dignity of possessions that men may not forget who is king either out of their hopes or fears who shall be if the sun should part with all his light to any of the stars the indians would not know where to find their god after he had so deposed himself and would make the light wherever it went the object of their worship all usurpation is alike upon sovereignty it is no matter from what hand it cometh and crowned heads are to be more circumspect in respect men's thoughts are naturally apt to ramble beyond what is present they love to work at a distance and in their greedy expectations which their minds may be filled with of a new master the old one may be left to look a little out of countenance our trimmer owneth a passion for liberty yet so restrained that it doth not in the least impair or taint his allegiance he thinketh it hard for a soul that doth not love liberty ever to raise itself to another world he taketh it to be the foundation of all virtue and the only seasoning that giveth a relish to life and though the laziness of a slavish subjection hath its charms for the more gross and earthly part of mankind yet to men made of a better sort of clay all that the world can give without liberty hath no taste it is true nothing is sold so cheap by unthinking men but that doth no more lessen the real value of it 
in a country fellow's ignorance doth that of a diamond in selling it for a pot of ale liberty is the mistress of mankind she hath powerful charms which do so dazzle us that we find beauties in her which perhaps are not there as we do in other mistresses yet if she was not a beauty the world would not run mad for her therefore since the reasonable desire of it ought not to be restrained and that even the unreasonable desire of it cannot be entirely suppressed those who would take it away from a people possessed of it are likely to fail in the attempting or be very unquiet in the keeping of it our trimmer admireth our blessed constitution in which dominion and liberty are so well reconciled it giveth to the prince the glorious power of commanding freemen and to the subject the satisfaction of seeing the power so lodged as that their liberties are secure it doth not allow the crown such a ruining power as that no grass can grow where e'er it treadeth but a cherishing and protecting power such a one as hath a grim aspect only to the offending subjects but is the joy and the pride of all the good ones their own interest being so bound up in it as to engage them to defend and support it and though in some instances the king is restrained yet nothing in the government can move without him our laws make a distinction between vassalage and obedience between a devouring prerogative and a licentious ungovernable freedom and as of all the orders of building the composite is the best so ours by a happy mixture and a wise choice of what is best in others is brought into a form that is our felicity who live under it and the envy of our neighbor that cannot imitate it the crown hath power sufficient to protect our liberties the people have so much liberty as is necessary to make them useful to the crown our government is in a just proportion no tyranny no unnatural swelling either of power or liberty and whereas in all overgrown monarchies reason learning and inquiry are hanged in effigy for mutineers here they are encouraged and cherished as the surest friends to a government established upon the foundation of law and justice when all is done those who look for perfection in this world may look as the jews have for their messiahs and therefore our trimmer is not so unreasonably partial as to free our government from all objections no doubt there have been fatal instances of its sickness and more than that of its mortality for some time though by a miracle it hath been revived again but till we have another race of mankind in all constitutions that are bounded there will ever be some matter of strife and contention and rather than want pretensions men's passions and interests will raise them from the most inconsiderable causes our government is like our climate there are winds which are sometimes loud and unquiet and yet with all the trouble they give us we owe great part of our health unto them they clear the air which else would be like a standing pool and instead of refreshment would be a disease unto us there may be fresh gales of asserting liberty without turning into such storms of hurricane as that the state should run any hazard of being cast away by them these strugglings which are natural to all mixed governments while they are kept from growing into convulsions do by a mutual agitation from the several parts rather support and strengthen than weaken or maim the constitution and the whole frame instead of being torn or disjointed cometh to be the better and closer knit by being thus exercised but whatever faults our government may have or a discerning critic may find in it when he looketh upon it alone let any other be set against it and then it showeth its comparative beauty 
let us look upon the most glittering outside of unbounded authority and upon a nearer inquiry we shall find nothing but poor and miserable deformity within let us imagine a prince living in his kingdom as if in a great galley his subjects tugging at the oar laden with chains and reduced to real rags that they may gain him imaginary laurels let us represent him gazing among his flatterers and receiving their false worship like a child never contradicted and therefore always cousined or like a lady complimented only to be abused condemned never to hear truth and consequently never to do justice wallowing in the soft bed of wanton and unbridled greatness not less odious to the instruments themselves than to the objects of his tyranny blown up into an ambitious dropsy never to be satisfied by the conquest of other people or by the oppression of his own by aiming to be more than a man he falleth lower than the meanest of them a mistaken creature swelled with panegyrics and flattered out of his senses and not only an encumbrance but a nuisance to mankind a hardened and unrelenting soul and like some creatures that grow fat with poisons he groweth great by other men's miseries an ambitious ape of the divine greatness an unruly giant that would storm even heaven itself but that his scaling ladders are not long enough in short a wild and devouring creature in rich trappings and with all his pride no more than a whip in god's almighty hand to be thrown into the fire when the world hath been sufficiently scourged with it this picture laid in right colors would not invite men to wish for such a government but rather to acknowledge the happiness of our own under which we enjoy all the privilege reasonable men can desire and avoid all the miseries many others are subject to so that our trimmer would keep it with all its faults and doth as little forgive those who give the occasion of breaking it as he doth those that take it our trimmer is a friend to parliaments notwithstanding all their faults and excesses which of late have given such matter of objection to them he thinketh that though they may at some times be troublesome to authority yet they add the greatest strength to it under a wise administration he believeth no government is perfect except a kind of omnipotence reside in it to exercise upon great occasions now this cannot be obtained by force alone upon people let it be never so great there must be their consent too or else a nation moveth only by being driven a sluggish and constrained motion void of that life and vigor which is necessary to produce great things whereas the virtual consent of the whole being included in their representatives and the king giving the sanction to the united sense of the people every act done by such an authority seemeth to be an effect of their choice as well as a part of their duty and they do with an eagerness of which men are incapable whilst under a force execute whatsoever is so enjoined as their own wills better explained by parliament rather than from the terror of incurring the penalty of the law for omitting it and by means of this political omnipotence whatever sap or juice there is in a nation may be to the last drop produced whilst it riseth naturally from the root whereas all power exercised without consent is like the giving wounds and gashes and tapping a tree at unseasonable times for the present occasion which in a very little time must needs destroy it our trimmer believeth that by the advantage of our situation there can hardly any such sudden disease come upon us but that the king may have time enough left to consult with his physicians in parliament pretense indeed may be made but a real necessity so pressing that no delay is to be admitted is hardly to be imagined and it will be neither easy to give an instance of any such thing for the time past or reasonable to presume it will ever happen for the time to come 
but if that strange thing should fall out our trimmer is not so straight-laced as to let a nation die or to be stifled rather than it should be helped by any but the proper officers the cases themselves will bring the remedies along with them and he is not afraid to allow that in order to its preservation there is a hidden power in government which would be lost if it was defined a certain mystery by virtue of which a nation may at some critical times be secured from ruin but then it must be kept as a mystery it is rendered useless when touched by unskilful hands and no government ever had or deserved to have that power which was so unwary as to anticipate their claim to it our trimmer cannot help thinking it had been better if the triennial act had been observed because tis the law and we would not have the crown by such an example teach the nation to break it all irregularity is catching it hath a contagion in it especially in an age so much more inclined to follow ill patterns than good ones he would have had a parliament because tis an essential part of the constitution even without the law it being the only provision in extraordinary cases in which there would be otherwise no remedy and there can be no greater solecism in government than a failure of justice he would have had one because nothing else can unite and heal us all other means are mere shifts and projects houses of cards to be blown down with the least breath and cannot resist the difficulties which are even presumed in things of this kind and he would have had one because it might have done the king good and could not possibly have done him hurt without his consent which in that case is not to be supposed and therefore for him to fear it is so strange and so little to be comprehended that the reasons can never be presumed to grow in our soil or to thrive in it when transplanted from any other country and no doubt there are such irresistible arguments for calling a parliament that though it might be denied to the unmannerly mutinous petitions of men that are malicious and disaffected it will be granted to the soft and obsequious murmurs of his majesty's best subjects and there will be such rhetoric in their silent grief that it will at last prevail against the artifices of those who either out of guilt or interest are afraid to throw themselves upon their country knowing how scurvily they have used it that day of judgment will come though we know neither the day nor the hour and our trimmer would live so as to be prepared for it with full assurance in the meantime that the lamenting voice of a nation cannot long be resisted and that a prince who could so easily forgive his people when they had been in the wrong cannot fail to hear them when they are in the right. End of The Trimmer's Opinion of the Laws and Government Read by John Greenman This is Section 12 of The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE TRIMMER'S OPINION CONCERNING THE PROTESTANT RELIGION Religion hath such a superiority above other things, and that indispensable influence upon all mankind, that it is as necessary to our living happy in this world as it is to our being saved in the next. Without it man is an abandoned creature, one of the worst beasts nature hath produced and fit only for the society of wolves and bears therefore in all ages it hath been the foundation of government and though false gods have been imposed upon the credulous part of the world yet they were gods still in their opinion and the awe and reverence men had to them and their oracles kept them within bounds towards one another which the laws with all their authority could never have effected without the help of religion the laws would not be able to subdue the perverseness of men's wills 
which are wild beasts and require a double chain to keep them down for this reason tis said that it is not a sufficient ground to make war upon a neighboring state because they are of another religion let it be never so differing yet if they worship nor acknowledge no deity at all they may be invaded as public enemies of mankind because they reject the only thing that can bind them to live well with one another the consideration of religion is so twisted with that of government that it is never to be separated and though the foundations of it ought to be eternal and unchangeable yet the terms and circumstances of discipline are to be suited to the several climates and constitutions so that they may keep men in a willing acquiescence unto them without discomposing the world by nice disputes which can never be of equal moment with the public peace our religion here in england seemeth to be distinguished by a peculiar effect of god almighty's goodness in permitting it to be introduced or rather restored by a more regular method than the circumstances of most other reformed churches would allow them to do in relation to the government and the dignity with which it hath supported itself since and the great men of our church hath produced ought to recommend it to the esteem of all protestants at least our trimmer is very partial to it for these reasons and many more and desireth that it may preserve its due jurisdiction and authority so far he is from wishing it oppressed by the unreasonable and malicious cavils of those who take pains to raise objections against it the questions will then be how and by what methods this church shall best support itself the present circumstances considered in relation to dissenters of all sorts i will first lay this for a ground that as there can be no true religion without charity so there can be no true humane prudence without bearing and condescension this principle doth not extend to oblige the church always to yield to those who are disposed to contest with her the expediency of doing it is to be considered and determined according to the occasion and this leads me to lay open the thoughts of our trimmer in reference first to the protestants and then to the popish recusants what hath lately happened among us maketh an apology necessary for saying anything that looketh like favor towards a sort of men who have brought themselves under such a disadvantage the late conspiracy hath such broad symptoms of the disaffection of the whole party that upon the first reflections while our thoughts are warm it would almost persuade us to put them out of the protection of our good nature and to think that the christian indulgence which our compassion for other men's sufferings cannot easily deny seemeth not only to be forfeited by the ill appearances that are against them but even becometh a crime when it is so misapplied yet for all this upon second and cooler thoughts moderate men will not be so ready to involve a whole party in the guilt of a few and to admit inferences and presumptions to be evidence in a case where the sentence must be so heavy as it ought to be against all those who have a fixed resolution against the government established besides men who act by a principle grounded upon moral virtue can never let it be clearly extinguished by the most repeated provocations if a right thing agreeable to nature and good sense taketh root in the heart of a man that is impartial and unbiased no outward circumstances can ever destroy it it is true the degrees of a man's zeal for the prosecution of it may be differing the faults of other men the considerations of the public and the seasonable prudence by which wise men will ever be directed may give great allays they may lessen and for a time perhaps suppress the exercise of that which in general propositions may be reasonable 
but still whatever is so will inevitably grow and spring up again having a foundation in nature which is never to be destroyed our trimmer therefore endeavoreth to separate the detestation of those who had either a hand or a thought in the late plot from the principle of prudential as well as christian charity towards mankind and for that reason would fain use the means of reclaiming such of the dissenters as are not incurable and even of bearing to a degree those that are as far as may consist with the public interest and security he is far from justifying an affected separation from the communion of the church and even in those that mean well and are mistaken he looketh upon it as a disease that hath seized upon their minds very troublesome as well as dangerous by the consequence it may produce he doth not go about to excuse their making it an indispensable duty to meet in numbers to say their prayers such meetings may prove mischievous to the state at least the laws which are the best judges have determined that there is danger in them he hath good nature enough to lament that the perverseness of a part should have drawn rigorous laws upon the whole body of the dissenters but when they are once made no private opinion must stand in opposition to them if they are in themselves reasonable they are in that respect to be regarded even without being enjoined if by the change of time and circumstances they should become less reasonable than when they were first made even then they are to be obeyed too because they are laws till they are mended or repealed by the same authority that enacted them he hath too much deference to the constitution of our government to wish for more prerogative declarations in favor of scrupulous men or to dispense with penal laws in such manner or to such an end that suspecting men might with some reason pretend that so hated a thing as persecution could never make way for itself with any hopes of success otherwise than by preparing the deluded world by a false prospect of liberty and indulgence the inward springs and wheels whereby the engine moved are now so fully laid open and exposed that it is not supposable that such a baffled experiment should ever be tried again the effect it had at the time and the spirit it raised will not easily be forgotten and it may be presumed the remembrance of it may secure us from any more attempts of that nature for the future we must no more break a law to give men ease than we are to rifle an ouse with a devout intention of giving the plunder to the poor in this case our compassion would be as ill-directed as our charity in the other in short the veneration due to the laws is never to be thrown off let the pretenses be never so specious yet with all this he cannot bring himself to think that an extraordinary diligence to take the uttermost penalty of laws upon the poor offending neighbor is of itself such an all-sufficient virtue that without anything else to recommend men it should entitle them to all kind of preferments and rewards he would not detract from the merits of those who execute the laws yet he cannot think such a piece of service as this can entirely change the man and either make him a better divine or a more knowing magistrate than he was before especially if it be done with a partial and unequal hand in reverence to greater and more dangerous offenders our trimmer would have those mistaken men ready to throw themselves into the arms of the church and he would have those arms as ready to receive them that shall come to us he would have no supercilious look to fright those strayed sheep from coming into the fold again no ill-natured maxims of an eternal suspicion or a belief that those who have once been in the wrong can never be in the right again but a visible preparation of mind to receive with joy all the proselytes that come amongst us and much greater earnestness to reclaim than punish them it is to be confessed 
there is a great deal to forgive a hard task enough for the charity of a church so provoked but that must not cut off all hopes of being reconciled yet if there must be some anger left still let it break out into a christian revenge and by being kinder to the children of disobedience than they deserve let the injured church triumph by throwing shame and confusion of face upon them there should not always be storms and thunder a clear sky would sometime make the church look more like heaven and would do more towards the reclaiming those wanderers than a perpetual terror which seemeth to have no intermission for there is in many and particularly in english men a mistaken pleasure in resisting the dictates of rigorous authority a stomach that riseth against a hard imposition nay in some even a lust in suffering from a wrong point of honor which doth not want the applause from the greater part of mankind who have not learnt to distinguish constancy will be thought a virtue even where it is a mistake and the ill-judging world will be apt to think that opinion most right which produceth the greatest number of those who are willing to suffer for it all this is prevented and falls to the ground by using well-timed indulgence and the stubborn adversary who valueth himself upon his resistance whilst he is oppressed yieldeth insensibly to kind methods when they are applied to him and the same man naturally melteth into conformity who perhaps would never have been beaten into it we may be taught by the compassion that attendeth the most criminal men when they are condemned that faults are much more natural things than punishments and that even the most necessary acts of severity do some kind of violence to our nature whose indulgence will not be confined within the straight bounds of inexorable justice so that this should be an argument for gentleness besides that it is the likeliest way to make these men ashamed of their separation whilst the pressing them too hard tendeth rather to make them proud of it our trimmer would have the clergy supported in their lawful rights and in all the power and dignity that belongeth to them and yet he thinketh that possibly there may be in some of them a too great eagerness to extend the ecclesiastical jurisdiction which though it may be well intended yet the straining of it too high hath an appearance of ambition that raiseth men's objections to it and is so far unlike the apostolic zeal which was quite otherwise employed that the world draweth inferences from it which do the church no service he is troubled to see men of all sides sick of a calenture of a mistaken devotion and it seemeth to him that the devout fire of mistaken charity with which the primitive christians were inflamed is long since extinguished and instead of it a devouring fire of anger and persecution breaketh out in the world we wrangle now one with another about religion till the blood cometh whilst the ten commandments have no more authority with us than if they were so many obsolete laws or proclamations out of date he thinketh that a nation will hardly be mended by principles of religion where morality is made a heresy and therefore as he believeth devotion misplaced when it gets into a conventicle he concludeth that loyalty is so too when lodged in a drunken club those virtues deserve a better seat of empire and they are degraded when such men undertake their deference as have too great need of an apology themselves our trimmer wisheth that some knowledge may go along with the zeal on the right side and that those who are in possession of the pulpit would quote at least so often the authority of the scriptures as they do that of the state there are many who borrow too often arguments from the government to use against their adversaries and neglect those that are more proper and would be more powerful a divine groweth less and putteth a diminution on his own character 
when he quoteth any law but that of god almighty to get the better of those who contest with him and as it is a sign of a decayed constitution when nature with good diet cannot expel nauseous humors without calling foreign drugs to her assistance so it looketh like want of health in a church when instead of depending upon the power of that truth which it holdeth and the good examples of them that teach it to support itself and to suppress errors it should have a perpetual recourse to the secular authority and even upon the slightest occasions our trimmer hath his objections to the too busy diligence and to the overdoing of some of the dissenting clergy and he doth as little approve of those of our church who wear god almighty's liveries as some old warders in the tower do the kings who do nothing in their place but receive their wages for it he thinketh that the liberty of the late times gave men so much light and diffused it so universally amongst the people that they are not now to be dealt with as they might have been in ages of less enquiry and therefore though in some well-chosen and dearly beloved auditories good resolute nonsense backed with authority may prevail yet generally men are become so good judges of what they hear that the clergy ought to be very wary how they go about to impose upon their understandings which are grown less humble than they were in former times when the men in black had made learning such a sin in the laity that for fear of offending they made a conscience of being able to read but now the world is grown saucy and expecteth reasons and good ones too before they give up their own opinions to other men's dictates though never so magisterially delivered to them our trimmer is far from approving the hypocrisy which seemeth to be the reigning vice amongst some of the dissenting clergy he thinketh it the most provoking sin men can be guilty of in relation to heaven and yet which may seem strange that very sin which shall destroy the soul of the man who preacheth may help to save those of the company that hear him and even those who are cheated by the false ostentation of his strictness of life may by that pattern be encouraged to the real practice of those christian virtues which he doth so deceitfully profess so that the detestation of this fault may possibly be carried on too far by our own orthodox divines if they think it cannot be enough expressed without bending the stick another way a dangerous method and a worse extreme for men of that character who by going to the outmost line of christian liberty will certainly encourage others to go beyond it no man doth less approve the ill-bred methods of some of the dissenters in rebuking authority who behave themselves as if they thought ill manners necessary to salvation yet he cannot but distinguish and desire a mean between the sauciness of some of the scotch apostles and the undecent courtship of some of the silken divines who one would think do practice to bow at the altar only to learn to make the better legs at court our trimmer approveth the principles of our church that dominion is not founded in grace and that our obedience is to be given to a popish king in other things at the same time that our compliance with him in his religion is to be denied yet he cannot but think it a very extraordinary thing if a protestant church should by a voluntary election choose a papist for their guardian and receive directions for supporting their religion from one who must believe it a mortal sin not to endeavor to destroy it such a refined piece of breeding would not seem to be very well placed in the clergy who will hardly find precedence to justify such an extravagant piece of courtship and which is so unlike the primitive methods which ought to be our pattern he hath no such unreasonable tenderness for any sorts of men as to expect their faults should not be impartially laid open as often as they give occasion for it and yet he cannot but smile to see that the same man who setteth up all the sails of his rhetoric to fall upon the dissenters when popery is to be handled 
he doth it so gingerly that he looketh like an ass mumbling of thistles so afraid he is of letting himself loose where he may be in danger of letting his duty get the better of his discretion our trimmer is far from relishing the impertinent wanderings of those who pour out long prayers upon the congregation and all from their own stock which god knoweth for the most part is a barren soil which produceth weeds instead of flowers and by this means they expose religion itself rather than promote men's devotions on the other side there may be too great restraint to put upon men whom god and nature hath distinguished from their fellow laborers by blessing them with a happier talent and by giving them not only good sense but a powerful utterance too hath enabled them to gush out upon the attentive auditory with a mighty stream of devout and unaffected eloquence when a man so qualified endued with learning too and above all adorned with a good life breaketh out into a warm and well-delivered prayer before his sermon it hath the appearance of a divine rapture he raiseth and leadeth the hearts of the assembly in another manner than the most composed or best studied form of set words can ever do and the prewees who serve up all their sermons with the same garnishing would look like so many statues or men of straw in the pulpit compared with those who speak with such a powerful zeal that men are tempted at the moment to believe heaven itself hath dictated their words to em our trimmer is not so unreasonably indulgent to the dissenters as to excuse the irregularities of their complaints and to approve their threatening styles which are so ill-suited to their circumstances as well as to their duty he would have them to show their grief and not their anger to the government and by such a submission to authority as becometh them if they cannot acquiesce in what is imposed let them deserve a legislative remedy to their sufferings there being no other way to give them perfect redress and either to seek it or pretend to give it by any other method would not only be vain but criminal too in those that go about it yet with all this there may in the meantime be a prudential latitude left as to the manner of prosecuting the laws now in force against them the government is in some degree answerable for such an administration of them as may be free from the censure of impartial judges and in order to that it would be necessary that one of these methods be pursued either to let loose the laws to their utmost extent without any moderation or restraint in which at least the equality of the government would be without objection the penalties being exacted without remission from the dissenters of all kinds or if that will not be done and indeed there is no reason it should there is a necessity of some connivance to the protestant dissenters to excuse that which in humanity must be allowed to the papists even without any leaning towards them which must not be supposed in those who are or shall be in the administration of public business and it will follow that according to our circumstances the distribution of such connivance must be made in such a manner that the greatest part of it may fall on the protestant side or else the objections will be so strong and the inferences so clear that the friends as well as the enemies of the crown will be sure to take hold of them it will not be sufficient to say that the papists may be connived at because they are good subjects and that the protestant dissenters must suffer because they are ill ones these general maxims will not convince discerning men neither will any late instances make them forget what passed at other times in the world both sides have had their turns in being good and ill subjects and therefore tis easy to imagine what suspicions would arise in the present conjecture if such a partial argument as this should be imposed upon us the truth is this matter speaks so much of itself that it is not only unnecessary but it may be unmannerly to say any more of it 
our trimmer therefore could wish that since notwithstanding the laws which deny churches to say mass in not only the exercise but also the ostentation of popery is as well or better performed in the chapels of so many foreign ministers where the english openly resort in spite of proclamations and orders of council which are grown to be as harmless things to them as the pope's bulls and excommunications are to heretics who are out of his reach i say he could wish that by a seasonable as well as an equal piece of justice there might be so much consideration had of the protestant dissenters as that there might be at some times and at some places a veil thrown over an innocent and retired conventicle and that such an indulgence might be practised with less prejudice to the church or diminution to the laws it might be done so as to look rather like a kind of omission to inquire more strictly than an allowed toleration of that which is against the rule established such a skilful hand as this is very necessary in our circumstances and the government by making no sort of men entirely desperate doth not only secure itself from villainous attempts but lay such a foundation for healing and uniting laws whenever a parliament shall meet that the seeds of differences and animosities between the several contending sides may heaven consenting be for ever destroyed end of the trimmer's opinion concerning the protestant religion read by john greenman this is section thirteen of the complete works of george saville first marquis of halifax this librivox recording is in the public domain the trimmer's opinion concerning the papists by george saville first marquis of halifax read by john greenman to speak of popery leadeth me into such a sea of matter that it is not easy to forbear launching into it being invited by such a fruitful theme and by a variety never to be exhausted but to confine it to the present subject i will only say a short word of the religion itself of its influences here at this time and of our trimmer's opinion in relation to our manner of living with them if a man would speak maliciously of this religion one may say it is like those diseases where as long as one drop of the infection remaineth there is still danger of having the whole mass of blood corrupted by it in swedland there was an absolute cure and nothing of popery heard of till queen christina whether moved by arguments of this or the other world may not be good manners to inquire thought fit to change her religion and country and to live at rome where she might find better judges of her virtues and less ungentle censures of those princely liberties to which she was sometimes disposed than she left at stockholm where the good breeding is as much inferior to that of rome in general as the civility of the religion the cardinals having rescued the church from those clownish methods the fishermen had first introduced and mended that pattern so effectually that a man of that age if he should now come into the world would not possibly know it in denmark the reformation was entire in some states of germany as well as geneva the cure was universal but in the rest of the world where the protestant religion took place the popish humor was too tough to be totally expelled and so it was in england though the change was made with all the advantage imaginable to the reformation it being countenanced and introduced by legal authority and by that means might have been perhaps as perfect as in any other place if the short reign of edward the sixth and the succession of a popish queen had not given such advantage to that religion that it hath subsided ever since under all the hardships that have been put upon it it hath been a strong compact body and made the more so by these sufferings 
it was not strong enough to prevail but it was able with the help of foreign support to carry on an interest which gave the crown trouble and to make a considerable not to say dangerous figure in the nation so much as this could not have been done without some hopes nor these hopes kept up without some reasonable grounds in queen elizabeth's time the spanish zeal for their religion and the revenge for eighty eight gave warmth to the papists here and above all the right of the queen of scots to succeed was while she lived sufficient to give them a better prospect of their affairs in king james time their hopes were supported by the treaty of the spanish match and his gentleness towards them which they were ready to interpret more in their own favor than was either reasonable or became them so little tenderness they have even where it is most due if the interest of their religion cometh in competition with it as for the late king though he gave the most glorious evidence that ever man did of his being a protestant yet by the more than ordinary influence the queen was thought to have over him and it so happening that the greatest part of his anger was directed against the puritans there was such an advantage to men disposed to suspect that they were ready to interpret it a leaning towards popery without which handle it was morally impossible that the ill-affected part of the nation could ever have seduced the rest into a rebellion that which helped to confirm many well-meaning men in their misapprehensions of the king was the long and unusual intermission of parliaments so that every year that passed without one made up a new argument to increase their suspicion and made them presume that the papists had a principal hand in keeping them off this raised such heats in men's minds to think that men who were obnoxious to the laws instead of being punished should have credit enough to secure themselves even at the price of destroying the fundamental constitution that it broke out into a flame which before it could be quenched had almost reduced the nation to ashes amongst the miserable effects of that unnatural war none hath been more fatal to us than the forcing our princes to breathe in another air and to receive the early impressions of a foreign education the barbarity of the english towards the king and the royal family might very well tempt him to think the better of everything he found abroad and might naturally produce more gentleness at least towards a religion by which he was hospitably received at the same time that he was thrown off and persecuted by the protestants though his own subjects to aggravate the offence the queen mother as generally ladies do with age grew most devout and earnest in her religion and besides the temporal rewards of getting larger subsidies from the french clergy she had motives of another kind to persuade her to show her zeal and since by the roman dispensatory a soul converted to the church is a sovereign remedy and layeth up a mighty stock of merit she was solicitous to secure herself in all events and therefore first set upon the duke of gloucester who depended so much upon her good will that she might for that reason have been induced to believe the conquest would not be difficult but it so fell out that he either from his own constancy or that he had those near him by whom he was otherwise advised chose rather to run away from her importunity than by staying to bear the continual weight of it it is believed she had better success with another of her sons who if he was not quite brought off from our religion at least such beginnings were made as made them very easy to be finished his being of a generous and aspiring nature and in that respect less patient in the drudgery of arguing might probably help to recommend a church to him that exempts the laity from the vexation of inquiring perhaps he might though by mistake look upon that religion as more favorable to the enlarged power of kings a consideration which might have its weight with a young prince in his warm blood and that was brought up in arms 
i cannot hinder myself from a small digression to consider with admiration that the old lady of rome with all her wrinkles should yet have charms able to subdue great princes so far from handsome and yet so imperious so painted and yet so pretending after having abused deposed and murthered so many of her lovers she still findeth others glad and proud of their new claims a thing so strange to indifferent judges that those who will allow no other miracles in the church of rome must needs grant this is one not to be contested she sitteth in her shop and selleth at dear rates her rattles and her hobby-horses whilst the deluded world still continueth to furnish her with customers but whither am i carried with this contemplation it is high time to return to my text and to consider the wonderful manner of the king's coming home again led by the hand of heaven and called by the voice of his own people who received him if possible with joys equal to the blessing of peace and union which his restoration brought along with it by this there was an end put to the hopes some might have abroad of making use of his less happy circumstances to throw him into foreign interests and opinions which had been wholly inconsistent with our religion our laws and all other things that are dear to us yet for all this some of those tinctures and impressions might so far remain as though they were very innocent in him yet they might have ill effects here by softening the animosity which seemeth necessary to the defender of the protestant faith in opposition to such a powerful and irreconcilable an enemy you may be sure that among all the sorts of men who applied themselves to the king at his first coming home for his protection the papists were not the last nor as they fain would have flattered themselves the least welcome having their past sufferings as well as their present professions to recommend them and there was something that looked like a particular consideration of them since it so happened that the indulgence promised to dissenters at breda was carried on in such a manner that the papists were to divide with them and though the parliament notwithstanding its resignation to the crown in all things rejected with scorn and anger a declaration framed for this purpose yet the birth and steps of it gave such an alarm that men's suspicions once raised were not easily laid asleep again to omit other things the breach of the triple league and the dutch war with its appurtenances carried jealousies to the highest pitch imaginable and fed the hopes of one party and the fears of the other to such a degree that some critical revolutions were generally expected when the ill success of that war and the sacrifice france thought fit to make of the papists here to their own interest abroad gave them another check and the act of enjoining the test to all in offices was thought to be no ill bargain to the nation though bought at the price of one million two hundred thousand pound and the money applied to continue the war against the dutch than which nothing could be more unpopular or less approved notwithstanding these discouragements popery is a plant that may be mowed down but the root will still remain and in spite of the laws it will sprout up and grow again especially if it should happen that there should be men in power who in weeding it out of our garden will take care to cherish and keep it alive and though the law for excluding them from places of trust was tolerably kept as to their outward form yet there were many circumstances which being improved by the quick-sighted malice of ill-affected men did help to keep up the world in their suspicions and to blow up jealousies to such a height both in and out of parliament that the remembrance of them is very unpleasant and the example so extravagant that it is to be hoped nothing in our age like it will be reattempted 
but to come closer to the case in question in this condition we stand with the papists what shall now be done according to our trimmer's opinion in order to the better bearing this grievance since as i have said before there is no hopes of being entirely free from it papists we must have amongst and if their religion keep them from bringing honey to the hive let the government try at least by gentle means to take away the sting from them the first foundation to be laid is that a distinct consideration is to be had of the popish clergy who have such an eternal interest against all accommodation that it is a hopeless thing to propose anything to them less than all their stomachs have been set for it ever since the reformation they have pinned themselves to a principle that admits no mean they believe protestants will be damned and therefore by an extraordinary effect of christian charity they would destroy one half of england that the other might be saved then for this world they must be in possession for god almighty to receive his rents for him not to a compt till the day of judgment which is a good kind of tenure and ye cannot well blame the good men that will stir up the laity to run any hazard in order to the getting them restored what is it to the priest if the deluded zealot undoeth himself in the attempt he singeth masses as jollily and with as good a voice at rome or st omer's as ever he did is a single man and can have no wants but such as may be easily supplied yet that he may not seem altogether insensible or ungrateful to those that are his martyrs he is ready to assure their executors and if they please will procure a grant sub annulo piscatoris that the good man by being hanged hath got a good bargain and saved the singeing of some hundred of years which he would else have had in purgatory there's no cure for this order of men no expedient to be proposed so that though the utmost severity of the laws against them may in some sort be mitigated yet no treaty can be made with men who in this case have left themselves no free will but are so muffled by zeal tied by vows and kept up by such unchangeable maxims of the priesthood that they are to be left as desperate patients and looked upon as men that will continue in an eternal state of hostility till the nation is entirely subdued to them it is then only the lay papists that are capable of being treated with and we are to examine of what temper they are and what arguments are the most likely to prevail upon them and how far it is advisable for the government to be indulgent to them the lay papists generally keep their religion rather because they will not break company with those of their party than out of any settled zeal that hath roots in them most of them do by the mediation of the priests marry amongst one another to keep up an ignorant position by hearing only one side others by a mistake look upon it as they do upon escutcheons the more ancient religion of the two and as some men of a good pedigree will despise meaner men though never so much superior to them by nature so these undervalue reformation as an upstart and think there is more honor in supporting an old error than in embracing what seemeth to them to be a new truth the laws have made them men of pleasure by excluding them from public business and it happeneth well they are so since they will the more easily be persuaded by arguments of ease and conveniency to them they have not put off the man in general nor the englishman in particular those who in the late storm against them went into other countries though they had all the advantage that might recommend them to a good reception yet in a little time they chose to steal over again and live here with hazard rather than abroad with security there is a smell in our native earth better than all the perfumes in the east there is something in a mother though never so angry that the children will more naturally trust her 
than the studied civilities of strangers let them be never so hospitable therefore tis not advisable nor agreeing with the rules of governing prudence to provoke men by hardships to forget that nature which else is sure to be of our side when these men by fair usage are put again into their right senses they will have quite differing reflections from those which rigor and persecution had raised in them a lay papist will first consider his abbey lands which notwithstanding whatever hath or can be alleged must sink considerably in the value the moment that popery prevails and it being a disputable matter whether zeal might not in a little time get the better of the law in that case a considering man will admit that as an argument to persuade him to be content with things as they are rather than run this or any other hazard by change in which perhaps he may have no other advantage than that his now humble confessor may be raised to a bishopric and from thence look down superciliously upon his patron or which is worse run to take possession for god almighty of his abbey in such a manner as the usurping landlord as he will then be called shall hardly be admitted to be so much as a tenant to his own lands lest his title should prejudge that of the church which will then be the landlord he will think what disadvantage tis to be looked upon as a separate creature depending upon a foreign interest and authority and for that reason exposed to the jealousy and suspicion of his countrymen he will reflect what an encumbrance it is to have his house a pasture for hungry priests to graze in which have such a never-failing influence upon the foolish which is the greatest part of every man's family that a man's dominion even over his own children is mangled and divided if not totally undermined by them than to be subject to what arbitrary taxes the popish convocation shall impose upon him for the carrying on the common interest of that religion under penalty of being marked out for half an heretic by the rest of the party to have no share in business no opportunity of showing his own value to the world to live at the best and useless and by others to be thought a dangerous member of the nation where he is born is a burthen to a generous mind that cannot be taken off by all the pleasure of a lazy unmanly life or by the nauseous enjoyment of a dull plenty that produceth no food for the mind which will be considered in the first place by a man that hath a soul when he shall think that if his religion after his wading through a sea of blood come at last to prevail it would infinitely lessen if not entirely destroy the glory riches strength and liberty of his own country and what a sacrifice is this to make to rome where they are wise enough to wonder there should be such fools in the world as to venture struggle and contend nay even die martyrs for that which should it succeed would prove a judgment instead of a blessing to them he will conclude that the advantages of throwing some of their children back again to god almighty when they have too many of them are not equal to the inconveniences they may either feel or fear by continuing their separation from the religion established temporal things will have their weight in the world and though zeal may prevail for a time and get the better in a skirmish yet the war endeth generally on the side of flesh and blood and will do so till mankind is another thing than it is at present and therefore a wise papist in cold blood considering these and many other circumstances which twill be worth his pains to see if he can unmuffle himself from the mask of infallibility will think it reasonable to set his imprisoned senses at liberty and that he hath a right to see with his own eyes hear with his own ears and judge by his own reason the consequences of which might probably be that weighing things in a right scale and seeing them in their true colors he would distinguish between the merit of suffering for a good cause 
and the foolish ostentation of drawing inconveniences upon himself and therefore will not be unwilling to be convinced that our protestant creed may make him happy in the other world and the easier in this a few of such wise proselytes would by their example draw so many after them that the party would insensibly melt away and in a little time without any angry word we should come to a union that all good men would have reason to rejoice at but we are not to presume upon these conversions without preparing men for them by kind and reconciling arguments nothing is so against our nature as to believe those can be in the right who are too hard upon us there is a deformity in everything that doth us hurt and it will look scurvily in our eye while the smart continueth and a man must have an extraordinary measure of grace to think well of a religion that reduceth him and his family to misery in this respect our trimmer would consent to the mitigation of such laws as were made as it is said king henry the eighth got queen elizabeth in a heat against rome it may be said that even states as well as private men are subject to passion a just indignation of a villainous attempt produceth at the same time such remedies as perhaps are not without some mixture of revenge and therefore though time cannot repeal a law it may by a natural effect soften the execution of it there is less danger to rouse a lion when at rest than to awake laws that were intended to have their times of sleeping nay more than that in some cases their natural periods of life dying of themselves without the solemnity of being revoked any otherwise than by the common consent of mankind who do cease to execute when the reasons in great measure fail that first created and justified the rigor of such unusual penalties our trimmer is not eager to pick out some places in history against this or any other party quite contrary it is very solicitous to find out anything that may be healing and tend to an agreement but to prescribe the means of this gentleness so as to make it effectual must come from the only place that can furnish remedies for this cure viz a parliament in the meantime it is to be wished there may be such a mutual calmness of mind as that the protestants might not be so jealous as still to smell the match that was to blow up the king and both houses in the gunpowder treason or to start at every appearance of popery as if it were just taking possession on the other side let not the papists suffer themselves to be led by any hopes though never so flattering to a confidence or ostentation which must provoke men to be less kind to them let them use modesty on their sides and the protestants indulgence on theirs and by this means there would be an overlooking of all venial faults a tacit connivance at all things that do not carry scandal with them and would amount to a kind of natural dispensation with the severe laws since there would be no more accusers to be found when the occasions of anger and animosity are once removed let the papists in the meantime remember that there is a respect due from all the lesser numbers to greater a deference to be paid by an opinion that is exploded to one that is established such a thought well digested will have an influence upon their behavior and produce such a temper as must win the most eager adversaries out of their ill humor to them and give them a title to all the favor that may be consistent with the public peace and security end of the trimmer's opinion concerning the papists read by john greenman this is section 14 of the complete works of george savile first marquis of halifax this librivox recording is in the public domain the trimmer's opinion in relation to things abroad read by john greenman the world is so composed that it is hard if not impossible for a nation not to be a great deal involved in the fate of their neighbors 
and though by the felicity of our situation we are more independent than any other people yet we have in all ages been concerned for our own sakes in the revolutions abroad there was a time when england was the overbalancing power of christendom and that either by inheritance or conquest the better part of france received laws from us after that we being reduced into our own limits france and spain became the rivals for the universal monarchy and our third power though in itself less than either of the other happened to be superior to any of them by that choice we had of throwing the scales on that side to which we gave our friendship i do not know whether this figure did not make us as great as our former conquest to be a perpetual umpire of two great contending powers who gave us all their courtship and offered all their incense at our altar whilst the fate of either prince seemed to depend upon the oracles we delivered for the king of england to sit on his throne as in the supreme court of justice to which the two great monarchs appeal pleading their cause and expecting their sentence declaring which side was in the right or at least if we pleased which side should have the better of it was a piece of greatness which was peculiar to us and no wonder if we endeavored to preserve it as we did for a considerable time it being our safety as well as glory to maintain it but by a fatality upon our counsels or by the refined policy of this latter age we have thought fit to use industry to destroy this mighty power which we have so long enjoyed and that equality between the two monarchs which we might for ever have preserved hath been chiefly broken by us whose interest it was above all others to maintain it when one of them like the overflowing of the sea had gained more upon the other than our convenience or indeed our safety would allow instead of mending the banks or making new ones we ourselves with our own hands helped to cut them to invite and make way for a farther inundation france and spain have had their several turns in making use of our mistakes and we have been formerly as deaf to the instances of the then weaker part of the world to help them against the house of austria as we can now be to the earnestness of spain that we would assist them against the power of france gondomar was as saucy and as powerful too in king james his court as any french ambassador can have been at any time since men talked as wrong then on the spanish side and made their court by it as well as any can have done since by talking as much for the french so that from that time instead of weighing in a wise balance the power of either crown it looketh as if we had learned only to weigh the pensions and take the heaviest it would be tedious as well as unwelcome to recapitulate all wrong steps so that i will go no farther than the king's restoration at which time the balance was on the side of france and that by the means of cromwell who for a separate interest of his own had sacrificed that of the nation by joining with the stronger side to suppress the power of spain which he ought to have supported such a method was natural enough to an usurper and showed he was not the lawful father of the people by his having so little care of them and the example coming from that hand one would think should for that reason be less likely to be followed but to go on home cometh the king followed with courtships from all nations abroad of which some did it not only to make them forget how familiarly they had used him when he was in other circumstances but to bespeak the friendship of a prince who besides his other greatness was yet more considerable by being re-established by the love of his people france had an interest either to dispose us to so much good will or at least to put us into such a condition that we might give no opposition to their designs and flanders being a perpetual object in their eye a lasting beauty for which they have an incurable passion and not being kind enough to consent to them 
they meditated to commit a rape upon her which they thought would not be easy to do while england and holland were agreed to rescue her whenever they should hear her cry out for help to them to this end they put in practice seasonable and artificial whispers to widen things between us and the states and boina and the fishery must be talked of here the freedom of the seas and the preservation of trade must be insinuated there and there being combustible matter on both sides in a little time it took fire which gave those that kindled it sufficient cause to smile and hug themselves to see us both fall into the net they had laid for us and it is observable and of good example to us if we will take it that their design being to set us together at cuffs to weaken us they kept themselves lookers-on till our victories began to break the balance then the king of france like a wise prince was resolved to support the beaten side and would no more let the power of the sea than we ought to suffer the monarchy of europe to fall into one hand in pursuance to this he took part with the dutch and in a little time made himself umpire the peace between us some time after upon pretence of his queen's title to part of flanders by right of devolution he falleth into it with a mighty force for which the spaniard was so little prepared that he made a very swift progress and had such a torrent of undisputed victory that england and holland though the wounds they had given one another were yet green being struck with the apprehension of so near a danger to them thought it necessary for their own defence to make up a sudden league into which sweden was taken to interpose for a peace between the two crowns this had so good an effect that france was stopped in its career and the peace of aix-la-chapelle was a little after concluded twas a forced put and though france wisely dissembled their inward dissatisfaction yet from that very moment they resolved to untie the triple knot whatever it cost them for his christian majesty after his conquering meals ever riseth with a stomach and he liked the pattern so well that it gave him a longing desire to have the whole piece amongst the other means used for the attaining this end the sending over the duchess of orleans was not the least powerful she was a very welcome guest here and her own charms and dexterity joined with other advantages that might help her persuasions gave her such an ascendant that she should hardly fail of success one of the preliminaries of her treaty though a trivial thing in itself yet was considerable in the consequence as very small circumstances often are in relation to the government of the world about this time a general humor in opposition to france had made us throw off their fashion and put on vests that we might look more like a distinct people and not be under the servility of imitation which ever payeth a greater deference to the original than is consistent with the equality all independent nations should pretend to france did not like this small beginning of ill-humors at least of emulation and wisely considering that it is a natural introduction first to make the world their apes that they may be afterwards their slaves it was thought that one of the instructions madame brought along with her was to laugh us out of these vests which she performed so effectually that in a moment like so many footmen who had quitted their master's livery we all took it again and returned to our old service so that the very time of doing it gave a very critical advantage to france since it looked like an evidence of our returning to their interest as well as to their fashion and would give such a distrust of us to our new allies that it might facilitate the dissolution of the knot which tied them so within their bounds that they were very impatient till they were freed from the restraint but the lady had a more extended commission than this and without doubt laid the foundation of a new strict alliance quite contrary to the other in which we had been so lately engaged 
and of this there were such early appearances that the world began to look upon us as falling into apostasy from the common interest notwithstanding all this france did not neglect at the same time to give good words to the dutch and even to feed them with hopes of supporting them against us when on a sudden that never to be forgotten declaration of war against them cometh out only to vindicate his own glory and to revenge the injuries done to his brother in england by which he became our second in this duel so humble can this prince be when at the same time he doth us more honour than we deserve he layeth a greater share of the blame upon our shoulders than did naturally belong to us the particulars of that war our part in it while we stayed in it and when we were out of breath our leaving the french to make an end of it are things too well known to make it necessary and too unwelcome in themselves to incite me to repeat them only the wisdom of france is in this to be observed that when we had made a separate peace which left them single to oppose the united force of the confederates they were so far from being angry that they would not show so much as the least coldness hoping to get as much by our mediation for a peace as they would have expected from our assistance in the war our circumstances at that time considered this seasonable piece of indulgence in not reproaching us but rather allowing those necessities of state which we gave for our excuse was such an engaging method that it went a great way to keep us still in their chains when to the eye of the world we had absolutely broke loose from them and by what passed afterwards at nijmegen though the king's neutrality gave him the outward figure of a mediator it appeared that his interposition was extremely suspected of partiality by the confederates who upon that ground did both at and before the conclusion of that treaty treat his ministers there with a great deal of neglect in this piece as well as in that of the pyrenean and the aix la chapelle the king of france at the moment of making it had the thought of breaking it for a very little time after he broached his pretensions upon a lost which were things that if they had been offered by a less formidable hand would have been smiled at but ill arguments being seconded by good armies carry such a power with them that naked sense is a very unequal adversary it was thought that these airy claims were chiefly raised with the prospect of getting luxembourg for the equivalent and this opinion was confirmed by the blocking it up afterwards pretending to the country of chimay that it might be entirely surrounded by the french dominions and it was so pressed that it might have fallen in a little time if the king of france had not sent orders to his troops to retire and his christian generosity which was assigned for the reason of it made the world smile since it is seen how differently his devout zeal worketh in hungary that specious reason was in many respects ill-timed and france itself gave it so faintly that at the very time it looked out of countenance the true ground of his retiring is worth our observation for at the instance of the confederates offices were done and memorials given but all ineffectual till the word parliament was put into them that powerful word had such an effect that even at that distance it raised the siege which may convince us of what efficacy the king of england's words are when he will give them their full weight and threaten with his parliament it is then that he appeareth that great figure we ought to represent him in our minds the nation his body he the head and joined with that harmony that every word he pronounceth is the word of a kingdom such words as appeareth by this example are as effectual as fleets and armies because they can create them and without this his words sound abroad like a faint whisper that is either not heard or which is worse not minded but though france had made this step of forced compliance it did not mean to leave off the pursuit of their pretensions and therefore immediately proposed the arbitration to the king 
but it appeared that notwithstanding his merit towards the confederates in saving luxembourg the remembrances of what had passed before had left such an ill taste in their mouths that they could not relish our being put into a condition to dispose of their interests and therefore declined it by insisting upon a general treaty to which france had ever since continued to be averse our great earnestness also to persuade the confederates to consent to it was so unusual and so suspicious a method that it might naturally make them believe that france spake to them by our mouth and for that reason if there had been no other might hinder the accepting it and so little care hath been taken to cure this or other jealousies the confederates may have entertained that quite contrary their ministers here every day take fresh alarms from what they observe in small as well as in greater circumstances and they being apt both to take and improve apprehensions of this kind draw such inferences from them as make them entirely despair of us thus we now stand far from being innocent spectators of our neighbor's ruin and by a fatal mistake forgetting what a certain forerunner it is to our own and now it is time our trimmer should tell something of his opinion upon this present state of things abroad he first professeth to have no bias either for or against france and that his thoughts are wholly directed by the interest of his own country he alloweth and hath read that spain used the same methods when it was in its height as france doth now and therefore it is not partiality that moveth him but the just fear which all reasonable men must be possessed with of an overgrowing power ambition is a devouring beast when it hath swallowed one province instead of being cloyed it hath so much of the greater stomach to another and being fed becometh still the more hungry so that for the confederates to expect a security from anything but their own united strength is a most miserable fallacy and if they cannot resist the encroachments of france by their arms it is in vain for them to dream of any other means of preservation it would have the better grace besides the saving so much blood and ruin to give up all at once make a present of themselves to appease this haughty monarch rather than be whispered flattered or cozened out of their liberty nothing is so soft as the first applications of a greater prince to engage a weaker but that smiling countenance is but a vizard it is not the true face for as soon as their turn is served the courtship flies to some other prince or state where the same part is to be acted over again leaveth the old mistaken friend to neglect and contempt and like an insolent lover to a cast-off mistress reproaches her with that infamy of which he himself was the author sweden bavaria palatine etc may by their fresh examples teach other princes what they are reasonably to expect and what snakes are hid under the flowers the court of france so liberally throweth upon them whilst they can be useful the various methods and deep intrigues with the differing notes in several countries do not only give suspicion but assurance that everything is put in practice by which universal monarchy may be obtained who can reconcile the withdrawing of his troops from luxembourg in consideration of the war in hungary which was not then declared and presently after encouraging the turk to take vienna and consequently to destroy the empire or who would think that the persecution of the poor protestants of france will be accepted by god as an atonement for hazarding the loss of the whole christian faith can he be thought in earnest when he seemed to be afraid of the spaniards and for that reason must have luxembourg and that he cannot be safe from germany unless he is in possession of strasbourg all injustice and violence must in itself be grievous but the aggravation of supporting him by false arguments and insulting reasons has something in it yet more provoking than the injuries themselves 
and the world hath ground enough to apprehend from such a method of arguing that even their senses are to be subdued as well as their liberties then the variety of arguments used by france in several countries is very observable in england and denmark nothing insisted on but the greatness and authority of the crown on the other side the great men in poland are commended who differ in opinion with the king and they argue like friends to the privilege of the diet against the separate power of the crown in sweden they are troubled that the king should have changed something there of late by his single authority from the ancient and settled authority and constitutions at Rasisbon, the most christian majesty taketh the liberties of all the electors and free states into his protection and telleth them the emperor is a dangerous man an aspiring hero that would infallibly devour them if he was not at hand to resist him on their behalf but above all in holland he hath the most obliging tenderness for the commonwealth and is in such disquiets lest it should be invaded by the prince of orange that they can do no less in gratitude than undo themselves when he bids them to show how sensible they are of his excessive good nature yet in spite of all these contradictions there are in the world such refined statesmen as will upon their credit affirm the following paradoxes to be real truth first that france alone is sincere and keepeth its faith and consequently that it is the only friend we can rely upon that the king of france of all men living hath the least mind to be a conqueror that he is a sleepy tame creature void of all ambition a poor kind of a man that hath no farther thoughts than to be quiet that he is charmed by his friendship to us that it is impossible he should ever do us hurt and therefore though flanders was lost it would not in the least concern us that he would fain help the crown of england to be absolute which would be to take pains to put it into a condition to oppose him as it is and must be our interest as long as he continueth in such an overbalancing power and greatness such a creed as this if once received might prepare our belief for greater things and as he that taught men to eat a dagger began first with a penknife so if we can be prevailed with to digest the smaller mistakes we may at last make our stomach strong enough for that of transubstantiation our trimmer cannot easily be converted out of his senses by these state sophisters and yet he hath no such peevish obstinacy as to reject all correspondence with france because we ought to be apprehensive of the too great power of it he would not have the king's friendship to the confederates extended to the involving him in any unreasonable or dangerous engagements neither would he have him lay aside the consideration of his better establishment at home out of his excessive zeal to secure his allies abroad but sure there might be a mean between these two opposite extremes and it may be wished that our friendship with france should at least be so bounded that it may consist with the humor as well as the interest of england there is no woman but hath her fears of contracting too near an intimacy with a much greater beauty because it exposeth her too often to a comparison that is not advantageous to her and sure it may become a prince to be as jealous of his dignity as a lady can be of her good looks and to be as much out of countenance to be thought an humble companion to so much a greater power to be always seen in an ill light to be so darkened by the brightness of a greater star is somewhat mortifying and when england might ride admiral at the head of the confederates to look like the kitching yacht to the grand louis is but a scurvy figure for us to make in the map of christendom it would rise upon our trimmer's stomach if ever which god forbid the power of calling and intermitting parliaments here should be transferred to the crown of france 
and that all the opportunities of our own settlements at home should give way to their projects abroad and that our interests should be so far sacrificed to our compliance that all the omnipotence of france can never make us full amends for it in the meantime he shrinketh at the dismal prospect he can by no means drive away from his thoughts that when france hath gathered all the fruit arising from our mistakes and that we can bear no more with them they will cut down the tree and throw it into the fire all this while some superfine statesmen to comfort us would fain persuade the world that this or that accident may save us and for all that is or ought to be dear to us would have us to rely wholly upon chance not considering that fortune is wisdom's creature and that god almighty loves to be on the wisest as well as the strongest side therefore this is such a miserable shift such a shameful evasion that they would be laughed to death for it if the ruining consequence of this mistake did not more dispose men to rage and a detestation of it our trimmer is far from idolatry in other things in one thing only he cometh near it his country is in some degree his idol he doth not worship the sun because tis not peculiar to us it rambles about the world and is less kind to us than others but for the earth of england though perhaps inferior to that of many places abroad to him there is divinity in it and he would rather die than see a spire of english grass trampled down by a foreign trespasser he thinketh there are a great many of his mind for all plants are apt to taste of the soil in which they grow and we that grow here have a root that produceth in us a stalk of english juice which is not to be changed by grafting or foreign infusion and i do not know whether anything less will prevail than the modern experiment by which the blood of one creature is transmitted into another according to which before the french blood can be let into our bodies every drop of our own must be drawn out of them our trimmer cannot but lament that by a sacrifice too great for one nation to make to another we should be like a rich mine made useless only for want of being wrought and that the life and vigor which should move us against our enemies is miserably applied to tear our own bowels that being made by our happy situation not only safer but if we please greater too than other countries which far exceed us in extent that having courage by nature learning by industry and riches by trade we should corrupt all these advantages so as to make them insignificant and by a fatality which seemeth peculiar to us misplace our active rage one against another whilst we are turned into statues on that side where lieth our greatest danger to be unconcerned not only at our neighbor's ruin but our own and let our island lie like a great hulk in the sea without rudder or sail all the men cast away in her or as if we were all children in a great cradle and rocked asleep to a foreign tune i say when our trimmer representeth to his mind our roses blasted and discolored whilst the lilies triumph and grow insolent upon the comparison when he considereth our own once flourishing laurel now withered and dying and nothing left us but a remembrance of a better part in history than we shall make in the next age which will be no more to us than an escutcheon hung upon our door when we are dead when he foreseeth from hence growing infamy from abroad confusion at home and all this without the possibility of a cure in respect of the voluntary fetters good men put upon themselves by their allegiance without a good measure of preventing grace he would be tempted to go out of the world like a roman philosopher rather than endure the burden of life under such a discouraging prospect 
but mistakes as all other things have their periods and many times the nearest way to cure is not to oppose them but stay till they are crushed with their own weight for nature will not allow anything to continue long that is violent violence is a wound and as a wound must be curable in a little time or else tis mortal but a nation comes near to be immortal therefore the wound will one time or another be cured though perhaps by such rough methods if too long forborne as may even make the best remedies we can prepare to be at the same time a melancholy contemplation to us there is but one thing god almighty's providence excepted to support a man from sinking under these afflicting thoughts and that is the hopes we draw singly from the king himself without the mixture of any other consideration though the nation was lavish of their kindness to him at his first coming yet there remaineth still a stock of warmth in men's hearts for him besides the good influences of his happy planet are not yet all spent and though the stars of men past their youth are generally declining and have less force like the eyes of decaying beauties yet by a blessing peculiar to himself we may yet hope to be saved by his autumnal fortune he hath something about him that will draw down a healing miracle for his and our deliverance a prince which seemeth fitted for such an offending age in which men's crimes have been so general that the not forgiving his people had been the destroying of them whose gentleness giveth him a natural dominion that hath no bounds with such a noble mixture of greatness and condescension an engaging look that disarmeth men of their ill humors and their resentments something in him that wanteth a name and can be no more defined than it can be resisted a gift of heaven of its lasting finishing where it will be peculiarly kind the only prince in the world that dares be familiar or that hath right to triumph over those forms which were first invented to give awe to those who could not judge and to hide defects from those that could a prince that hath exhausted himself by his liberality and endangered himself by his mercy who outshineth by his own light and natural virtues all the varnish of studied acquisitions his faults are like shades to a good picture or like allay to gold to make it the more useful he may have some but for any man to see them through so many reconciling virtues is a sacrilegious piece of ill-nature of which no generous mind can be guilty a prince that deserveth to be loved for his own sake even without the help of a comparison our love our duty and our danger all join to cement our obedience to him in short whatever he can do it is no more possible for us to be angry with him than with the bank that secureth us from the raging sea the kind shade that hideth us from the scorching sun the welcome hand that reacheth us a reprieve or with the guardian angel that rescueth our souls from the devouring jaws of wretched eternity end of the trimmer's opinion in relation to things abroad read by john greenman This is section 15 of the complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax, read by John Greenman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Character of a Trimmer. Conclusion. Read by John Greenman. To conclude, our trimmer is so fully satisfied of the truth of those principles by which he is directed in reference to the public, that he will neither be bald, threatened, laughed nor drunk out of them and instead of being converted by the arguments of his adversaries to their opinions he is very much confirmed in his own by them he professeth solemnly 
that were it in his power to choose he would rather have his ambition bounded by the commands of a great and wise master than let it range with a popular license though crowned with success yet he cannot commit such a sin against the glorious thing called liberty nor let his soul stoop so much below itself as to be content without repining to have his reason wholly subdued or the privilege of acting like a sensible creature torn from him by the imperious dictates of unlimited authority in what hand soever it happens to be placed what is there in this that is so criminal as to deserve the penalty of that most singular apothem a trimmer is worse than a rebel what do angry men ail to rail so against moderation doth it not look as if they were going to some very scurvy extreme that is too strong to be digested by the more considering part of mankind these arbitrary methods besides the injustice of them are god be thanked very unskilful too for they fright the birds by talking so loud from coming into the nets that are laid for them and when men agree to rifle a house they seldom give warning or blow a trumpet but there are some small statesmen who are so full charged with their own expectations that they cannot contain and kind heaven by sending such a seasonable curse upon their undertakings hath made their ignorance an antidote against their malice some of these cannot treat peaceably yielding will not satisfy them they will have men by storm there are others that must have plots to make their service more necessary and have an interest to keep them alive since they are to live upon them and persuade the king to retrench his own greatness so as to shrink into the head of a party which is the betraying him into such an unprincely mistake and to such a wilful diminution of himself that they are the last enemies he ought to allow himself to forgive such men if they could would prevail with the sun to shine only upon them and their friends and to leave all the rest of the world in the dark this is a very unusual monopoly and may come within the equity of the law which maketh it treason to imprison the king when such unfitting bounds are put to his favor and he confined to the narrow limits of a particular set of men that would enclose him these honest and only loyal gentlemen if they may be allowed to bear witness for themselves make a king their engine and degrade him into a property at the very time that their flattery would make him believe they paid divine worship to him besides these there is a flying squadron on both sides that are afraid the world should agree small dabblers in conjuring that raise angry apparitions to keep men from being reconciled like wasps that fly up and down buzz and sting to keep men unquiet but these insects are commonly short-lived creatures and no doubt in a little time mankind will be rid of them they were giants at least who fought once against heaven but for such pygmies as these to contend against it is such a provoking folly that the insolent bunglers ought to be laughed and hissed out of the world for it they should consider there is a soul in that great body of the people which may for a time be drowsy and unactive but when the leviathan is roused it moveth like an angry creature and will neither be convinced nor resisted the people can never agree to show their united powers till they are extremely tempted and provoked to it so that to apply cupping glasses to a great beast naturally disposed to sleep and to force the tame thing whether it will or no to be valiant must be learnt out of some other book than machiavel who would never have prescribed such a preposterous method it is to be remembered that if princes have law and authority on their sides the people on theirs may have nature which is a formidable adversary duty justice 
religion nay even humane prudence too biddeth the people suffer anything rather than resist but uncorrected nature where e'er it feels the smart will run to the nearest remedy men's passions in this case are to be considered as well as their duty let it be never so strongly enforced for if their passions are provoked they being as much a part of us as our limbs they lead men into a short way of arguing that admitteth no distinction and from the foundation of self-defence they will draw inferences that will have miserable effects upon the quiet of a government our trimmer therefore dreads a general discontent because he thinketh it differeth from a rebellion only as a spotted fever doth from the plague the same species under a lower degree of malignity it worketh several ways sometimes like a slow poison that hath its effects at a great distance from the time it was given sometimes like dry flax prepared to catch at the first fire or like seed in the ground ready to sprout upon the first shower in every shape tis fatal and our trimmer thinketh no pains or precaution can be so great as to prevent it in short he thinketh himself in the right grounding his opinion upon that truth which equally hateth to be under the oppressions of wrangling sophistry of the one hand or the short dictates of mistaken authority on the other our trimmer adoreth the goddess truth though in all ages she hath been scurvily used as well as those that worshipped her tis of late become such a ruining virtue that mankind seemeth to be agreed to commend and avoid it yet the want of practice which repealeth the other laws hath no influence upon the law of truth because it hath root in heaven and an intrinsic value in itself that can never be impaired she showeth her greatness in this that her enemies even when they are successful are ashamed to own it nothing but powerful truth hath the prerogative of triumphing not only after victories but in spite of them and to put conquest herself out of countenance she may be kept under and suppressed but her dignity still remaineth with her even when she is in chains falsehood with all her impudence hath not enough to speak ill of her before her face such majesty she carrieth about her that her most prosperous enemies are fain to whisper their treason all the power upon earth can never extinguish her she hath lived in all ages and let the mistaken zeal of prevailing authority christen any opposition to it with what name they please she maketh it not only an ugly and unmannerly but a dangerous thing to persist she hath lived very retired indeed nay sometime so buried that only some few of the discerning part of mankind could have a glimpse of her with all that she hath eternity in her she knoweth not how to die and from the darkest clouds that shade and cover her she breaketh from time to time with triumph for her friends and terror to her enemies our trimmer therefore inspired by this divine virtue thinketh fit to conclude with these assertions that our climate is a trimmer between that part of the world where men are roasted and the other where they are frozen that our church is a trimmer between the frenzy of platonic visions and the lethargic ignorance of popish dreams that our laws are trimmers between the excess of unbounded power and the extravagance of liberty not enough restrained that true virtue hath ever been thought a trimmer and to have its dwelling in the middle between the two extremes that even god almighty himself is divided between his two great attributes his mercy and his justice in such company our trimmer is not ashamed of his name and willingly leaveth to the bold champions of either extreme the honor of contending with no less adversaries than nature 